This meeting will now come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Carlin. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Council Member Patena. Here. Council Member Binsbacher. Here. Council Member Edwards. Here. Council Member Hunt. Here. And Council Member Dunn. Here. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council special meeting of June 16th, 2020. We have one item on our study session agenda this evening and it is the reclaimed water strategy update. So I will turn it over to our city manager, Jeff Tyne, to kick it off. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today about our reclaimed water system and uh, our review of that water system and its uh, trends and needs going forward in the future. Uh, important for our residents to know that Peoria's reclaimed water system has proven to be a very important method for conserving our potable water. And so, for example, recharging the treated water into our aquifer, uh, this has helped to extend our reserves during drought conditions, in addition, serving key areas, including the City Hall campus, uh, through reclaimed water, saving our potable water supplies there. Uh, however, the changing conditions on the Colorado River uh, has affected all of us in lower basin states and really requiring us to look at things from a new lens. Uh, likewise, some areas of the city have less ability to store groundwater and that makes reclaimed water even more of an important asset for us as the city continues to grow. So to talk about this important topic, we have a few folks that includes Deputy City Manager Eric Strunk, uh, as well as Kate Powers, our Water Services Director and Daniel Keel our planning and engineering manager who will present on our reclaimed master plan. I'll pass it over to Mr. Strunk. Great, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Mayor and Council, you may recall that it was in January of last year that we first came to you to discuss our water portfolio and how we've invested substantially to maintain a 100-year assured water supply in the city of Peoria. Um, as mentioned, and we will mention and tout it every chance we get, um, it's a series of accomplishments that's been brought on by good strategic thinking by not only this council, but previous councils. And we hope to continue in that vein through this presentation and subsequent presentations on water and wastewater. Um, one of the items we talked about uh, was, uh, well, one of the items that helped make a strong water portfolio um, for Peoria is the use of reclaimed water. And when we spoke to you in January, we indicated that uh, roughly about 11% of that water um, makes up our assured water supply. The good news is that's climbed a little bit and is anticipated to continue growing in stature. Um, basically, reclaimed water is, is manufactured wastewater. I know that may sound kind of icky, um, but we have three treatment facilities in the city of Peoria that Cape and Daniel will speak to you about. And we are able to take that wastewater and convert it into usable, bankable water that we then either use partially for irrigation in certain parts of the city and or re-inject into the groundwater table and potentially can draw it up later at a later date when we need it. This evening, we kind of want to accomplish a couple of object objectives. Uh, we are now nearing the end of a study that you provided funding to us for um, last fiscal year, um, an engineering study to determine long-term viability of, of reclaimed water and some potential routing to move reclaimed water from its current sources to broader parts of the city of Peoria. And we, we have been graciously funded for phase one of that, we call it phase one. We're gonna share a little bit of information with you on that tonight, how we're gonna move that water. But then there's some other components that are in the study that we will formally complete a little later this fall, but we know enough now that we're ready and willing and able to present to you what we hope to achieve through some long-term thinking. And to kind of walk us through that, obviously Cape is here and Daniel is here, and I'd like to turn it over to Cape to let him talk about reclaimed water and what we're thinking and where we hope to go with your permission. Cape? Yep. Thank you, Eric. Mayor and Council, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss the future of reclaimed water in Peoria. It's something I'm quite excited about. Uh, we are all stewards of Peoria's water assets, and we want to make sure that we leave behind a legacy of sound water management so that in 20 or 30 years, Peoria will be able to maximize the benefit of all of our water resources, including reclaimed water. What we'd like to do today is demonstrate how important reclaimed water will be to us in the future, uh, more important than it is even today. Talk about existing reclaimed water assets, 
and discuss our strategy, which incorporates past city comments. And when we have a few proposed projects to introduce, and then we'll talk about next steps moving forward. I will say that there are parts of this presentation that get a little technical, so please feel free to interrupt me anytime and ask questions. I'd like to start with a quick reminder of Peoria's overall water portfolio. You've all likely seen a version of this slide during past presentations, and this shows the water resources that we have available to us to serve current homes and businesses, as well as customers in the future as we grow. This list is per the 2010 Arizona designation of assured water supply from the Arizona Department of Water Resources. You can see we have about 25,000 acre feet per year of Central Arizona Project water, about 25,000 acre feet of SRP water, just under 8,000 acre feet of reclaimed water, 7,000 acre feet of Hia River. The subject of today's presentation is the reclaimed water portion of this list. It's important to note that the 7,899 acre feet of water listed is approximately the amount of reclaimed water we had available to us when the designation was done back in 2010. The amount of water that we have available has grown since then. It's around 11,000 acre feet. I think the important part is to realize that as we grow, the amount of reclaimed water we have available to us is gonna grow as well. And this number will likely grow up to be around 25,000 acre feet of water a year. So you can see in the future, it's gonna pay a huge uh, part in how we service water to all of our citizens. I think it's important to note that we have a master plan for reclaimed water. Uh, it's contained in our integrated water utilities master plan, or as we call it, the IWUMP. It's unfortunately named, but <laughs> however, we feel that significant change has occurred in our water world since the time it was last updated. And we believe now is the right time, as Eric mentioned, to re-examine this resource and adjust our strategy going forward. As a quick reminder, especially for folks in the audience and those watching remotely, that reclaimed water, as Eric mentioned, is highly processed water from our three wastewater treatment plants, or as we call them, water reclamation facilities. This water source is highly renewable. As long as we have residents taking showers and doing laundry, we're gonna have water flowing to our plants to treat, to make, and process reclaimed water. We currently primarily use this water for landscaping. Around 1,000 acre feet a year is done for that but the vast majority of it is recharged back into the ground to earn long-term storage credits. I mentioned that significant changes occurred in the water world, and much of this change is related to change in cost to perform certain items of work, especially drilling wells. There's also been a lot of technological advances, such as direct potable reuse that makes us reconsider how we use reclaimed water or plan to use it in the future. And there's also the evolution of water policy, and we believe that the possibility of future shortages loom larger now than they have in the past. We have to consider them a little more seriously. So now I'd like to dig into the details a little bit and take a look at our existing reclaimed water assets and some associated opportunities and risks. When we look at the existing system, we typically divide the city up into three zones that correspond to the service areas. Uh, that flow to the three wastewater treatment plants. That's the Joe Max, Beardsley, and Butler zones. You can see on the table uh, on the left-hand side that they make in total approximately 11,500 acre feet of water a year. Uh, and uh, at build out, these three plants will produce around 20,000 acre feet of water. You can also see we have a modest amount of reclaimed water or purple pipe systems currently in the ground in the various zones. So what I'd like to do now is quickly go through the three zones, outline the basic existing conditions, opportunities, and risks in each one of the zones. In the Jomac zone, reclaimed water from this facility is used to directly irrigate two golf courses, a school, land, many landscaping needs, primarily in the Vistancia development. The primary concern for this area is one of seasonality. The plant produces too little reclaimed water in the in the winter, and we actually end up making an extra 150, 000, or 150 acre feet of water a year that we don't have a use for. We end up putting it in a wash and we don't eventually get long-term storage credits. In the summer, the zone actually produces too little reclaimed water, and we end up having to add CAP raw water to the system to meet the demands of our residents. Lastly, I wanna point out that there's a large amount of growth planned for this zone. This is an opportunity to continue to develop the reclaimed water system northward concurrent with this land development. 
in the Beardsley Basin, currently all reclaimed water generated is recharged at the Beardsley Wastewater Treatment Plant site in large ponds. The water is simply put out into ponds where it infiltrates into the ground and helps uh, maintain aquifer levels. We have approximately 120 acre site there, largely undeveloped, that we could use as an asset in the future to help us manage reclaimed water. And there are numerous opportunities in the zone to directly utilize reclaimed water, none of which we're currently taking advantage of. So we have many parks and schools, turf areas, landscaped uh, areas that are currently irrigated with potable water in many cases that could be irrigated with reclaimed water if we had a system to do that. There's also a large amount of growth planned in this area north of the zone as well, okay, above Happy Valley Road in the Four Corners area. If we could get a source of reclaimed water north, we could follow the example of what's been done in Vistancia, where you extend these systems and build these systems out as the land is developed. It's a lot cheaper to do it that way. The third basin is Butler. Currently, a small amount of the reclaimed water from the facility is utilized for irrigation, about 250 acre feet a year in Pioneer Park and Centennial Plaza and one homeowners association. The vast majority of this water is conveyed to a large facility called the NAUSP uh, where the water is put out into ponds and infiltrated into the ground and we earn long-term storage credits. The facility is owned by the Salt River Project folks. It is physically located in Glendale, west of the stadium. This situation is less than ideal from a pure water resources perspective. We would much rather be infiltrating this water into the ground under our own city where we have more direct access to it in the future, especially in a time of water shortage. The risk at NAUSP is we only own about half the capacity at the facility that we need long term. This is because the facility was originally constructed. It was assumed to have a certain amount of capacity to put water into and the capacity ended up being in practice about half of what it was supposed to be. We own 20% of that facility. So our 20% originally was supposed to get us enough capacity to put all of Butler there. Uh, as that capacity shrunk, we no longer have enough storage availability in that spot. So every month, um, we end up essentially buying capacity from other people who also have ownership interests in there, usually Chandler and the Salt River Project folks themselves. Either one of these entities could make a different decision, leaving us at risk of not being able to gain beneficial use from our reclaimed water. And we've been working on ways to mitigate this risk, and we've actually approved, you folks have approved projects to help mitigate that risk. One of them was the construction of a well that actually injects water into the ground at the Butler um, Wastewater Treatment Plant site. The problem is that as good as this well is, it's, it's just now come in to play and we're currently using it. I've been using it for about a month now. The problem is we need about three more of them to really accommodate all the water we're gonna see out of that plant at full build out. And the costs of these things have gone up considerably. We used to think we could build a well like this for a couple of million dollars, which to me, even a couple of million seems like an awful lot of money. Uh, but now what we're seeing is these things are costing four to five million dollars. When you start thinking about needing three wells to do this and the costs are so large, it's time to step back, in my opinion, and, and take another look at what we're doing and if we're really planning the right future. Are there any questions on that? Awful lot of information, I'm sorry. No questions. Another concern in the Butler zone is related to how we access water in our Salt River project allocation. Recall that this water comes through us through the Arizona Canal. It's treated at the Greenway Water Treatment Plant and then is distributed to our customers through our distribution system. A portion of this Butler zone uh, is on land that is part of the original irrigated area in the Salt River project. And it's noted on the display here on the right hand side is I'll call it the polka dot area because I'm not sure what else to call it. It's not hatched. Uh, the concern is that we don't currently don't have the ability to utilize all of this water. Okay, we just don't have a, a, a use for it. Um, in 2019, for instance, we used just over 11,000 acre feet of SRP water, but we had access to 16,000 acre feet. So we're 5,000 acre feet we couldn't utilize. We're not allowed to transfer this water off project. We're not allowed to pump it north and use it and things like that. That's the rules of the SRP. And 
it, it's, uh, this water is actually some of our least expensive water we have available to us. So we'd like to be able to maximize this resource. It's important to note that using reclaimed water in this area, using it on project, long term, will essentially displace similar amounts of SRP water. So when we use reclaimed water there, it displaces SRP water, and ultimately it limits the amount of SRP water we can use in total. If we want to maximize our ability to utilize all the water in our portfolio, especially during a time of shortage, it is in our best interest to limit the use of reclaimed water on project. Any questions on that? Council, do you have any questions with regards to SRP water? We have to use it on project means on the, the SRP lands, so only in the southern third of our city. It is a fabulous water resource. We're so happy to have it, and yet there are restrictions on it about mm -hmm. how we can go about using it and how we can maximize its use. So. I think we're good to go. As we analyze the three water reclamation zones, all of the opportunities and risks, and try to imagine what the future holds with regards to technology advancements and economic development, we also referred back to council approved principles of sound water management. The basic fundamentals contained in this document, together with recent thoughts on reclaimed water, helped us form a series of strategic planning elements. The first one of these is right water, right place. And fundamentally, it's a pretty simple concept, right? It includes using an appropriate level of water quality for an appropriate corresponding use. In other words, you use potable water for potable water uses, and where you can use reclaimed water, you should use that lesser standard of water. The second strategy is to maximize SRP water on project lands, which I think we've discussed enough. <laughs> the next strategy, strategy includes the idea of interconnecting our reclaimed water assets. Having the ability to move water to where we need it now and in the future can address many of the opportunities and risks that we have discussed. Interconnecting assets is a very powerful tool to prepare for the future. If we end up in a position where we want to adopt something like direct potable reuse, having reclaimed water available in a centralized location will help us tremendously. DPR plants are very expensive, and I doubt that we're going to want to have multiple facilities like this in the city. Lastly, I think it's pretty obvious that maintaining relationships with surrounding cities and entities, such as the Central Arizona Project folks and Salt River Project, are very important. Many of the water resources, challenges that we have and will face in the future can be resolved through these relationships. The goal is to maintain access to all of our reclaimed water portfolio. And there's a lot of opportunity for deal making out there in the future that will benefit both parties. And we want to maintain an appropriate level of openness. Any questions? So the result of all this master planning work thus far is the development of four projects that can, over time, address the existing risks and take advantage of existing and future opportunities. What we'd like to do is take the next couple of minutes to cover these projects at admittedly a very high level. I'd like to stress that these projects are conceptual in nature, and there are many details left to be worked out, such as the exact routing, pipe sizing, and things like that. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Daniel Keel, our Water Resources Planning Engineering Manager. Good evening, Mayor and Council. As Kate mentioned, these projects are designed to form a backbone for reclaimed water delivery throughout Peoria. Project 1, which is what you see before you here, is designed to move reclaimed water from our Beersley Water Reclamation Facility north to Paloma Park. Essentially, this moves reclaimed water from the central part of Peoria to the north. In doing so, we allow for future expansions to the system that could add more users. These could include further developing areas north of the Loop 303 to SR 74, as well as turf areas in parks and schools, and potentially the Alba Freer Recharge Facility owned by the CAP. Although none of these proposed pipeline alignments are set in stone, we do expect this line will be approximately eight miles in length. The project anticipates repurposing an existing drinking water reservoir located in the Pleasant Valley HOA area for reclaimed water delivery. This would essentially serve as the northern reclaimed water hub. The project is currently funded in the capital improvement program and is estimated at approximately $15.5 million. Design will begin in FY21. Project 2 utilizes the existing backbone created with Project 1. Kate mentioned previously that interconnecting these reclaimed water systems provides us with great flexibility in the future. 
Project 2 accomplishes that and allows us to move reclaimed water into and out of the Vistancia area, essentially eliminating those seasonal demand issues. There are also some great possibilities for potential reclaimed water users here, including the Vistancia Commercial Corps. As stated earlier, the project is basically an extension to Project 1 and is expected to be approximately three miles in length. The cost for this project is estimated at $7 million, but it is not currently funded in the CIP. Project 3 shifts the focus to the southern part of the city. Kate mentioned the importance of utilizing less reclaimed water in the SRP on project areas. We also want the ability to utilize our reclaimed water within our own city limits. In other words, not sending it to the NAUSP facility. This project would construct a large transmission main that would instead move this water to the Beardsley Water Reclamation Facility. That water could then be moved further north via the previous projects I've mentioned or be recharged directly at the Beardsley site. Pipeline is expected to be approximately 11 miles long and the cost is estimated at approximately $20 million. This project is also currently not funded in the CIP. Should Project 3 become a reality, we will need to store more water at the Beardsley Water Reclamation Facility. This means constructing more recharge basins on the currently city-owned 120-acre property. What you see in this project is a concept drawing that shows the possibilities for turning this recharge project into a public amenity. The idea would essentially create a riparian preserve habitat with walking paths and public education features. It is important to note that recharge at this facility allows us to keep more of our water underneath us within our own city for our own future use. It allows us to centralize our reclaimed water delivery, making it much easier to provide to potential users. The estimated cost for this type of project is about three and a half million dollars, and the project is also not funded in the CIP. Thank you, Daniel. In summary, the construction of the proposed backbone system that connects our facilities would achieve most of the objectives we have as a city for our reclaimed water. It will certainly minimize the use of uh, reclaimed water in SRP territory and maximize the value of our water portfolio. It will reduce reliance on Central Arizona project water and encourage right water, right place usage. It also prepares us for the future and technological advancements like direct potable reuse, it will also allow us, as Daniel mentioned, to recharge this water within the city limits where possible. And it moves water to where it can be used and will be used more in the future. We're also excited about the other possibilities that come with the extensions off of these lines. So Daniel's described a backbone system. Well, we don't think that'll be the end of the system. We think you'll see extensions off of them to service eventually, you know, more facilities in the future whether it's Alta Vista Park or other schools or things like that, we see this as a community benefit that'll pay dividends for many, many years to come. But that, I'll turn it back over to Eric. Okay. Um, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Daniel. I think the, the next steps of where we'd like to go, as I indicated in the intro, there's a, a couple of items we're, we're asking for uh, this afternoon, if it's possible. Um, one is, uh, the good news is, the first project is funded in the CIP. Um, it looks like we have a potential alignment and we plan to, if council doesn't have any reservations, it's in the budget, we'd like to move forward and commence formal design work and then touch base with you appropriately as we award contracts for construction. Um, it's something that's been in the CIP for over a year now. It's rolling over in the next year. It's part of that initial phase one strategy. The other two pieces uh, that are very important to us, and I think um, as an organization, as a community, is there's about $30.5 million in unfunded projects that we talked about tonight, various pipelines and, and potential uses of that water. Um, we have many different financial models that we can consider when we look at how do we want to fund these things if you are in agreement that we should move forward and further explore those. If you provide that direction to us, um, we know um, we need to look a little more closely at those models. That would potentially include uh, consideration of a rate structure, um, how we are currently employing that. We are also in the process of looking at the rate structure and we're gonna have the results a little later um, this summer, early fall. It's our full intent to circle back with you um, through that avenue and address what we see um, just 
in our own capital program. If we were to add these additional items, that may have a further implication on that rate structure and or other financial mechanisms that we need to address with you. So long story short, we're in this moment. Um, we'd like to move forward with phase one. We, we, we hope we can. Um, the other three pieces, if you're open to it, we'd like to do our analysis further, blend it into this rate structure, finalize a study, and kind of come back to you later this summer, early fall, with the complete package in hand and go, okay, here's what we found out. It, it is a long-term um, concept, as Kate mentioned. It doesn't have to be done overnight. It can be paced out over a period of time based on the council's interest and willingness to do so. So with that, really, um, that's, that's our plan at the moment. There's another piece, too, that Kate spoke of and, and Daniel spoke of, and there's a reference, um, additional discussion of reclaimed water ordinances. Um, if we become more robust in our outlook and our pursuit of a strategic plan, it may require a closer look at what we already have in place and other elements that we can use as best practices for Peoria to further encourage the use of reclaimed water if we're gonna be constructing and, and pursuing this type of system. So there's additional conversation that will need to take place as well. With that, Mayor and Council, it kind of concludes our high overview. Um, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, so uh, this is your, your time and please let us know what we can do to, to help, help you along with uh, any decisions. All right, Council, do you have any discussion? Council Member Patena. Thank you, Mayor. So. Um, if we were to approve uh, all three phases, any idea what timeline we're looking at? You know, we, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of thoughts that go into that. And I think part of that simply has to be determined by the, the dollar amount of some of these projects. And I think that you have to have a study to take a look at it and figure out, you know, how you want to plan that out and how it fits into the existing CIP. Um, I think that uh, the project could benefit the city now, today, if they were currently in place. But we also realize that there's some realities there to get through in order to make those happen. Okay. And also, I noticed at one phase, there's three and a half miles of pipeline. There's three, 11 and a half miles of pipeline. What are we looking at in terms of construction issues? And um, will there be traffic problems? Uh, where are we going to be digging are we going to be digging streets up and all that stuff? So w what's the response to that? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And, you know, a little bit of that is to be determined because we haven't totally decided on the routes. But there's no doubt that if you build them, you know, a pipeline that long through your city, you're going to have some financial imp or some impacts to the public and the traveled way. You're going to have to cross streets. You're going to have to dig up some roads in order to make this happen. Part of our study and part of what we'd like to do with your approval here is going forward is really kind of tighten down on those alignments. We're really keyed on trying to minimize those impacts because they're not only impacts to the public, they're impacts to our budget, right? Every time we dig up a sidewalk, we have to replace it back. And we'd rather find routes that are least impacting. And that's, there's no doubt it's gonna have impacts, but it's part of the study to refine those and, and try and minimize them as we go forward. Councilmember Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I So I, what we would actually be approving today is moving forward with phase one, which is fully funded, right? And then uh, supporting the idea of exploring the alignment and funding options for the additional phases. So if I can interject there, since this is a study session, we're, we're not doing any, we're not approving anything okay. specifically. We're sort of concurring that they can bring things back to us in, in the form right. of budget amendments. Okay. Thanks. Well, I'm interested in hearing more about this, most definitely. And you mentioned when you started the presentation about, um, one of you did, I'm sorry, uh, about long-term thinking. And I think this is where we are. All of this infrastructure is necessary to plan for the future of our city. And I think um, it is obviously very expensive, but again, it's an investment in the future of our city. The sooner we get to work on this and finding ways to get it done, I think the less of an impact we could potentially see, um, the longer we wait, obviously, the greater the impact. So um, I'm interested in learning more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Dunn. 
Thank you for the presentation. I think it was very informative. And one of the things that um, I enjoy about living in the city of Peoria is that we do plan for our sustainable future. And we do it very well. And especially, you know, where water is concerned, I think that there's been so much preparation here. And I think we can't afford not to do some of these things because there's a saying that says, if, if you fail to plan, we plan to fail. And we can't fail in Peoria, and we owe it to our community and our citizens. So I appreciate all the hard work that you're doing putting this together to look forward into the future. So thank you. And I completely concur. I think that there, that, that there is an urgency in this matter. I think that we are already in need of reclaimed water in the northern part of our city where we have no access what to it, whatsoever to it. And we've done the study. You just have to do some fine tuning on that route. And I think we're ready to, to start going. Um, we've got the, the funds budgeted for phase one. So there is nothing stopping us now, right? <laughs> I think it's time to move forward. And I also would like to, to um, come back in future months uh, as we talk about the budget adjustments throughout the course of this year and into next year and see how we can get uh, the second and third phases of this into our CIP. Because we have to, we, I mean, there is nothing more important really than planning for water. There is. There is nothing that we need <laughs> as human beings more than we need water. And certainly if we get to the point where this drought continues on and we cannot afford the oh so expensive CAP cap water, the, the surface water that we have, uh, then we're really going to be talking about rate issues. You know, not doing this is going to have much larger rate implications for our residents than if we do it. So um, I am a firm believer that it is, it is never too late to start today. That's a new saying. <laughs> it's <laughs> never too late to start today. So I think that we um, should definitely move forward with this. We've, we've got it in the budget, and it's, it's time to do more than talk about it. And thank Great. you so much for all of the work that you have put into it. I know that it um, took a, a lot of planning and working with our um, consultant and working together to, to discover all that there is to know about underground Peoria uh, <laughs> and all of our friends who are also worrying about underground Peoria. So I appreciate all the work that you've done and all the things that you put into it and I'm ready for the next step. Great. So thank you. That's great. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Mr. Tyne, anything else? No, thank you. Uh, really appreciate Cape Daniel, all of your hard work, as the mayor had mentioned. Uh, to have this kind of strategic uh, approach can sometimes be very difficult, but I, I think you've teed it up well, looked at a great lot of different uh, possibilities that are out there, and I think exactly laid it out that um, ROI comes in a lot of different ways. And so more conversation to uh, be presented to you in a few months. Mm -hmm. That's all we have for our study session. Okay, thank you very much. With that, we are adjourned until our 6 p.m. meeting.
came back. One little duck went out to play over the hills and far away. Mama duck said, quack, 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 quack. But this time, no little ducks came back. Well, the daddy duck said, quack, quack, quack. And one, two, three, four, five little ducks came back. Good job, everyone. Yay. Well, that's the end of baby time. So it's time for us to say goodbye. But before we go, if you have enjoyed your baby time, please go to our website, library.peoriaaz.gov. There is a survey link there where you can tell us what you think of baby time at the Peoria Main Library. Bob, are you ready to say goodbye? All right. We wave goodbye like this. We wave goodbye like this. We clap our hands to all our friends. We wave goodbye like this. We wave goodbye like this. We wave goodbye like this. We wave goodbye to all our friends. We wave goodbye like this. Thank you for joining us for baby time at the Peoria Main Library. Everybody. My name is Justin Schlegel. I've been coaching with the city for about six years now. Today we're going to talk about basketball and some tips on shooting free throws. So the first thing, you want to be relaxed. You want to make sure you control your breathing and stay calm. So when you come up to the line, no matter how much you've been running up and down the court, you want to try to take some deep breaths and get into a rhythm. You want to have the same routine every single time so you can do the same thing and have hopefully the same positive result every time you're going to shoot a free throw. So if you're right-handed, you're gonna have a little bit of a staggered stance here. Make sure that your right foot is in front of your left, or if you're left-handed, you're gonna have your left foot in front of your right. If you come up square to the line like this, then you're just gonna to put too much pressure on your shoulders and you're gonna have an uneven shot. So you wanna have a little bit of bend in your legs. You wanna use your whole body and not just shoot stiffly. So your shoulders above your knees, above your feet. So you come up to the line, got your routine. like that. So I challenge you to work on these tips and practice until you can consistently make eight out of every 10 free throws that you shoot. Thank you for watching. The Tortoise and Hare Run Club is a, a training group for people who want to learn to run better, improve their running, enjoy running a little bit more. Running is the foundation of so many sports and, and, and we, we really feel like, like running can be a great endeavor all by itself, but running can also, I think, create a, a really great foundation for people who are interested in pursuing other sports as well. The thing that stands out for me about Tortoise and Hare is that they're really about that community. It's for runners of any ability, so from a new runner up through people that have been running for years, racing and things. So I really do think it's a great place to go if you're interested in running and you feel like you need that extra either accountability or the extra socialization. Our main mission is, is to you know, help people who want to become active, become active, people who are already active to help them stay active. We kind of give them tips on running, anything from drills that they can do, shoes, form, really what you need to do is set really small achievable goals. You can actually accomplish that, then it gives you the fuel to kind of build off of that and to keep going. We put on runs and races throughout Peoria, events like the ice cream run. All the money we raise from that event, we go out and we buy shoes for kids in Title I schools in the West Valley. So it's a great way for families to come together and experience a really great kind of world-class event in their hometown, in their backyard with a mission to give back to kids in need. We're really trying to get out in the community and make a difference in the place where we live and, and work. Hi, I'm Coach Jay Arthur. I've been coaching with the city of Peoria for about 20 seasons. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, a real basic concept of uh, football. It's the quarterback handing off to the running back, or it could be a receiver coming around from one side to the other. 
it's a very basic concept, but what we have to do and understand is that if we get the basics down, everything else will come to us. I have Connor here. Connor's going to demonstrate exactly where you're going to place the ball and how you set up to receive the ball from the quarterback. What I want to show you first is the position of your hands and arms. And Connor's going to show you his upper arm. He's going to come up here. If you see here where his thumb is pointing down, his pinky finger is up, he's going to be up here. This is if you're receiving the ball uh, from a play, you're going to the right side. The other arm is going to come up, and you're going to do what they call cradling, or this becomes a pocket. His pinky's kind of on his belly button, his hand is up here. So you see this area right here is where the quarterback is going to what they call a meshing point. And you're going to mesh with the running back in this spot. If you see that if you're running to uh, the right side, you're going to be able to put it right in the pocket because his elbow's up. And once it's in here, he's going to wrap around here and he's going to secure the ball so it can't get knocked out. And then he'll be able to advance the ball wherever direction he's going. Now, if you go to the opposite side, if you're running to the left, and you see the difference here, his right elbow comes up. His right elbow comes up, allows him uh, to receive the ball for the quarterback in an open area, his pocket or the cradle. And then again, just hand being down here, he's going to wrap around, and he's able to receive the ball and go to his left. repeating this. This is going to the left side. You see where his elbow is up. He wraps around and he goes. Back is going to the right side. Same thing. His elbow is up. He secures the ball and he advances. Going to the left side in game motion. Now in game motion to the right side, he's going to receive the ball. And as a review, just remember, you get your hands in position. If it's coming from this side, when the ball is coming in, elbow is going to be up. Have an opening and put it into the pocket bottom deal wraps around and he secures the ball. If it's from the other side, he's going to have the opposite elbow up. Again, he's going to come in and cradle it and wrap it around. One thing we want to remember, we don't want to have him reach for the ball when the ball is running around because it's able to fumble the ball down. And the other thing you don't want to do is if your elbow is in the way, if it's not properly up and has the wrong elbow down, you can cause a fumble. So those are real basic things. We don't want to have fumbles going on. We don't want to turn the ball over, and we don't want to have the play stop because the ball's fumbled. So it's real important that you receive the ball like we taught. Basic concept, you want to make sure you start off slow, work your way into it to game speed. Hello, uh, my name is Ray Garcia, and probably some of you know me from the Tai Chi classes at the adult center and uh, because of the current situation uh, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, do some of the exercises that we normally do in, in class. Uh, this class is just about warm-ups for Tai Chi but they can be used for anything and it's very important to to follow the principles uh, basic principles and I'll run through them real quick here. Uh, use your your body as a structural integration your skeleton to hold you up, but you want to be relaxed and you want to have this, this Chinese refer to it as the chi energy that goes through your body. And uh, what, what the main way that you can get this energy to go through your body is to loosen the joints and to relax your muscles. So our relaxation is a little different in the Chinese term. It's this loosening of the muscles, but not so loose that you, you sag but you have this energy and you're always aware that your muscles are kind of expanding kind of like a balloon, not real tight, not real loose, but enough to let the flow, this energy flow through your body. So that's the main thing. And, and, uh, and in order to achieve that, you have to follow the principles. And I like to wear this hat because now this signifies it's, it's the Tao, which is not a religion, it's a philosophy uh, that the Chinese have been using for thousands of years. And it's basically work with nature. So uh, your body, you want to have your body work uh, with gravity. And, and your structural alignment is very important in order for this to occur. It improves circulation, your balance, and, uh, and your, it strengthens your, your muscles. So uh, we'll begin with uh, this lesson is going to be on just the warm-up exercises. We have to remember the alignment. The, uh, Oh, never lock your joints and 
stay relaxed. Your head, atop your head, there's an acupressure site, and you want to, to feel as if there's a string pulling you up from the top, and, and you want to kind of hang like a puppet. Now, you can't do this throughout all the warm-ups, but most of them you can, and of course, when, you, when we do the form, you'll want to uh, keep that in mind. The legs are never locked. They're always slightly bent. Actually, all the joints are never locked. They're slightly bent. And uh, you want to breathe through the nose. So you breathe in and you, you want to feel your, your stomach actually expanding and contracting. And uh, let's see, as we go through this, uh, I'll remind myself and you of some of the other uh, features that you have to consider, little rules that you want to follow with Tai Chi. So the first one, the first exercise is called leg loosening. And we want to stand uh, with our feet at an angle a nice angle, 45 degrees, heels close, not touching, and you want to sink straight down, push down on one of your legs. I'm, I'm pushing down on my left leg and letting the right leg kind of float up on toe. And then you take your knee and you rotate it, and the object here is to rotate your inguinal fold, which the Chinese refer to as a qua. And you want to rotate it you know, maybe 30, 40, 50 times, and just loosen this whole area up, up between your torso and your leg to loosen up the, the, the joints in there. So we'll do about uh, a few, you know, I'm not gonna count them, but try to do about enough to just so you can feel that the, your leg is moving freely. And once you finish that, you go over to the other leg, you push down on the on the, un, the other leg and you rotate the other knee, of course. Just loosen up that joint. Try to really rotate it far and open that joint right up. Once you have that nice and loose, both legs are nice and loose, you want to stand in what's referred to as a standing uh, resting posture. You want your feet uh, about a shoulder's width, and in order to get a shoulder's width, you take your right uh, heel or left, doesn't matter, and put it into your ankle of the other foot. And then rotate up on toe like this, and then put it down somewhere right near there, and that's about a shoulder's width. So uh, we're gonna loosen our waist now. Uh, this is actually for the spine. You're gonna inhale and go all the way around, one complete inhale. This helps loosen up the spine really nicely. Keep your head suspended. Uh, try to focus on a distant object so that you don't move your head too much. And you wanna breathe in one complete cycle all the way around and then exhale the next time around. Do this about nine or 10 times in each direction. So you inhale and exhale. Now when you get to the ninth one, you stop at the front and you rotate the other direction. Inhale and exhale on each one. One complete inhale, one complete exhale. Just do it to, the, to your breath, whatever you can breathe in and breathe out comfortably. And when you get to the last one, you stop at this resting posture. Now the next exercise we're gonna do is called the bear. And it's actually got three components to it. So I'll demonstrate uh, each one of them and then we'll do them all at once. Now the idea uh, behind Tai Chi actually in, in all the forms 
there's just uh, two basic principles that we use for moving the waist and sinking or transferring the weight from one foot to the other. Now, keep in mind that the feet have to be, remain flat on the floor. There's, you want them even in this particular exercise. You want the, the weight evenly distributed on each one. We're gonna start with a 50-50. Now, uh, some, of the, some of the things that uh, we want to do is be aware that we're gonna go straight down on each leg. So go straight down on each leg and push, push down on the foot where you're going down, then push, push up so that the weight gets transferred from one foot to the other.
Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection in the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilmember Dunn. The clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Councilmember Patana. Here. Councilmember Binsbacher. Here. Councilmember Edwards. Here. Councilmember Hunt. Here. Councilmember Dunn. Here. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of June 16th, 2020. Uh, we will begin this evening with a presentation this is a proclamation recognizing July as National Park and Recreation Month. So I will begin by asking you to take a look at the screen behind me here and uh, we will show a short video highlighting Parks and Recreation Month. interrupting anything here. Uh, whereas parks and recreation programs are an essential part of communities throughout the country, including Peoria, Arizona, and whereas parks and recreation programs build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease, provide therapeutic recreation services for those who are mentally or physically disabled, and also improve the mental and emotional health of all citizens. And whereas during the current COVID-19 pandemic, the city of Peoria continues to encourage the utilization of its parks and trails in accordance with physical distancing protocols and provide online alternatives to in-person sports and activities. And whereas parks and recreation programs increase a community's economic prosperity through increased property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, the attraction and retention of businesses, and crime reduction. And whereas Peoria's 36 neighborhood parks, two community parks, 40 plus miles of shared use pathways, 10 miles of mountain trails, 548 acres of mountain recreational space and recreational facilities, such as the Rio Vista Recreation Center and the Peoria Sports Complex, are vitally important. All of these contribute to establishing and maintaining healthy neighborhoods, economic prosperity, superior public services and arts, cultural and recreational enrichment opportunities for the well being of our community. And whereas the new Paloma Community Park will soon add 85 developed acres of new and exciting recreational amenities and access to thousands of acres of natural open space for citizens and visitors alike. And whereas, as a CAPRA accredited organization, the City of Peoria assures continued excellence in quality and improvement of operation, management and service to the community. And whereas the City of Peoria, Arizona, proudly recognizes the benefits derived from its parks and recreation resources. Now, therefore, I, Kathy Carlett, Mayor of the City of Peoria, Arizona, do hereby proclaim July 2020 as Parks and Recreation Month. 
And with that, I would like to invite Mr. John Sefton, the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Community Facilities, to um, give us some remarks. I will not include whereas is. You've covered Thank them you all, so Mayor. Very Thank much. you so very <laughs> much. That. Wonderfully read. And uh, as ongoing counselors, thank you very much for your continued and persistent support of Parks and Recreation Month. Regardless of the month, since 1985, Americans have celebrated July as National Parks and Recreation Month. Arizona may have been outvoted in the selecting of July as <laughs> Parks and Recreation Month, but nonetheless, we shall enjoy and celebrate. This year's theme is We Are Parks and Recreation. We want to highlight the diversity of parks and recreation professionals and showcase their selfless work. Uh, in that, I'd like to recognize one of our selfless individuals, our Parks, Recreation, Community Facilities Board, board President, Jerry Johnson, joins us, as always, in the audience. Jerry, thank you for being here for this special presentation. And while Parks and Recreation are core elements to our department, I also want to recognize the Neighborhood and Human Services Department for their work in the realm of recreation. Uh, the team at the Community Center serving some of the community's most vulnerable through play, creativity, and teamwork. And the AMPM team making day camp adventures safe and fun. And the special events team that typically uh, enliven our neighborhood parks with special events. And as you saw highlighted, highlighted in the video, the Parks, Recreation, Community Facilities Department staff. They serve daily as stewards for our open space and our trails. They are caretakers for our parks, neighborhood, parks and neighborhood amenities. They're motivators for our citizens who are seeking better health and fitness. They're coaches for our youth and adult athletes, as well as those learning how to swim. And they are educators for those seeking access to information, lifelong learning, and leisure time experiences. At a time in our world when it's more evident than ever before that we live, that we must, as a community, uh, get together and recreate safely. Through play and, and a connection to our natural environment, we recreate ourselves and live a happier and healthier lives. The video at the end mentioned the CAPRA, and we mentioned in the, the um, pro pro proclamation as well, uh, the CAPRA stands for the Commission on the Accreditation of Parks and Recreation Agencies. We are one of four agent, uh, departments in the city of Peoria, very proud of that to be an accredited agency. Next week, we have a review, virtual review. Unfortunately, typically visitors would come and we would go through all of our evidence and our operations in detail from that other professional uh, perspective. But we will do that digitally, making some uh, adaptations to how we will do this. But our full commission will review in the fall and we hope to come back yet with another uh, five-year accredited status. So as a promise to Peoria, we do our very best in making Peoria the best place to live, work, and play. And thank you again, Mayor and Council, uh, for recognizing July as Parks and Recreation Month. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. You and your team make an incredible impact on our city, and we are, we are very grateful and proud of everything that you do. Thank, thank you. you. Right. We will now move on to the consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine or have been previously reviewed by the city council and will be enacted by one motion unless a council member requests an item to be removed and considered in the normal sequence on the agenda. Additionally, tonight's consent agenda includes items that require a public hearing. If there is any member of the public present who wants to address a public hearing on the consent agenda, please complete a speaker request form and place it in the bin next to the speaker's podium still doing that. This item will be removed from the consent agenda and heard during the normal course of the regular agenda. Is there any items that need to be removed from the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, Council, or is there any items to be removed? Any discussion on the consent agenda? Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. And it passes unanimously. We will be having our voting buttons returned at the end of the summer break. Mm -hmm. We will now move on to the regular agenda with new business. And we will begin with item 34R, Mystic at Lake Pleasant Heights Community Facilities District Formation. Mr. Tyne. 
Great, thank you, Mayor. And Sonia Andrews, our Chief Financial Officer, will provide a presentation on this. Thank you. Should be a presentation. So while he's looking for the presentation, <laughs> items 34R and items 35R, I'm going to present it together. Okay. And um, they're related to the formation of the community facilities, districts, or CFDs, as we call it. 34R is related to Mystic at Lake Pleasant Heights, and 35R is for the Vistancia North CFD. Um, so for each of these items, there are two resolutions. The first resolution is ordering and declaring formation of the CFD and approving and authorizing execution of the development agreement. I'll go through this in, in a little bit more detail later on in the slides. And the second resolution is appointing two members to the CFD boards. So for each item, there's two resolutions, and we can vote as one for each, each of the items. Um, just as a recap, at the last council meeting on June 2nd, we brought a study session to council on the CFDs. So I wanted to just give you this timeline as a recap as to where we are in this process. As we mentioned on June 2nd, CFDs are complex. They take a long time for all the negotiations and considerations. So for these two CFD, the process started back in 2018. So for the last two years, we've been working collaboratively with the developers on all the negotiating, all the terms and considerations, working with them on the applications. And we're pleased that in May, the two developers submitted their final completed application. Like I said, on June 2nd, we had a study session where we went into rather uh, quite a lot of details on these CFDs. And tonight, on uh, June 16th, we're here in front of council with the resolutions to form these CFDs and appoint the two members. After that, we will have a district board meeting to call the bond elections. So that's the process. Now, at our June uh, second study session, we went into, like I said, we went into quite a lot of detail on how we use these CFDs and all the considerations involved. So I'm not going to go through that tonight, but I'd like to bring back a few slides just to recap what we talked about and also for the benefit of our audience who weren't there on June 2nd. So the first slide I wanted to share is the CFD boundaries. These two CFDs are in the northern part of our city. Uh, Vistancia North is you know, outlined in the dark green, and Mystic at Lake Pleasant Heights is in the red. Um, Vistancia North CFD ha will have about 3,200 homes with an average price of 475000 with national home builders. And Mystic, similarly, will have about 2,563 homes at an average price of 377000 also with national home builders. And as we talked about, um, CFDs are financing mechanisms, so they do finance regional infrastructure for the city. Um, for Vistancia North, they will be financing major uh, sewer and water infrastructure, and for Mystic, the CFD will finance the major uh, road infrastructure and the water and wastewater w uh, along with that. Um, there's significant benefits to the city in that the infrastructure is built and the land is developed. And then likewise, the significant benefits to the developer as they can access this pipe of financing when they can't do that privately on their own. So there is benefits on both sides in creating these CFDs. And um, a staff recommends the CFD formation. We did receive petitions that was signed by all the landowners in both the CFDs, and because we received petitions signed by 100% of the landowners, we do not need to hold a public hearing. We do not need to mail or post or publish the formation of the CFD. Council can um, move directly to uh, adopting a resolution for formation. The applications that we received adheres to state statutes and the city's CFD policies in that the infrastructure being financed and funded 
is appropriate according to our policies. The tax rate proposed at 265 is reasonable and there, we have negotiated proper protections for the property owners. There's financial commitments from the developers and there's no reliance on the city's general fund. So these two CFDs will be self-supporting. Now, I'd like to go into the, as I mentioned earlier, each of these items have two uh, resolutions within each item. The first resolution is ordering and declaring the CFD formation and also approving and authorizing the development agreement. The major components of the resolution that you will be considering is accepting and granting the petition in favor of creating the CFD, it is also accepting the CFD boundary. It's also acknowledging that the application and general plan have been filed with the city clerk, approving and authorizing execution of the development agreement, and establishing that the CFD board will be made up of the council plus the two members. So that is what is in the resolution that is you're considering. Approving and authorizing the development agreement, the major components of the development agreement are establishing that the target tax rate is 265, establishing that the maximum debt authority for each of these CFDs, 50 million for Vistancia North and 65 million for Mystic at Lake Pleasant Heights. The development agreement also establishes the restrictions on the debt terms as we talked about on our um, study session, also establishes the security for the debt payments and the indemnity deposits, and also the requirements for the home buyer disclosures. So that's what's in the development agreement that you are approving as well. And then the second resolution appointing the two citizen members to the CFD board. The state law, uh, the, the Community Facilities Districts Act, the state law, requires the petitioners to designate two citizen members to the CFD board. So the petitioners, or the developers here, has, they have designated Jerry Johnson and Mike Heath to their CFD board. Jerry is in the audience tonight, and Mike is at home watching. Um, the state statute requires the terms to be six years for each of these board members, and we will do the oath of office at our first CFD board meeting in August. So with that, um, I am open for questions, and again, there's two resolutions for each of these items and uh, council can um, do one vote for each item. Okay, thank you. Council, are there any questions or discussions on item 34 or 35R? Councilmember Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanna clarify one thing. So you had mentioned that these two CFDs are self-supporting, they stand alone, and I just wanted to clarify that. Um, they're in no way affect the uh, to the existing CFDs in that area. Doesn't that is, affect the term, rate, nothing. Yes, Mayor, Council, Ms. Barker, that is absolutely correct. The formation of these CFDs will not affect the existing Vistancia CFD. The existing Vistancia CFD have a 210 tax rate. They will not, their tax rate will remain at 210 and that actually their tax rate will sunset in 2026. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, and I would just like to commend these two um, landowners and developers for working together so well to create some compatibility between um, the, the two parcels where they will end up hitting each other closely, uh, working on 265 together and, and um, just being so considerate of each other's uh, best interests as well as the city. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think that it's been a long time coming and I'm glad to finally be able to, to vote on this. So with that council, I will take a, we will vote on them separately. Um, item 34R, do I have a motion? Um, Mayor, I will move to um, accept item 34R. Second? Second. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. And that passes unanimously. And now for item 35R, this is the Vistancia North Community Facilities District. Do I have a motion? On so moved. 35. We have a motion and a second. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. 
and it passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of your work on that, Sonia. And now we will move on to item 36R, which is Stadium Point at P83, Memorandum of Understanding. Mr. Time. Great. Thank you, Mayor. And we are excited to discuss uh, an economic opportunity for the city uh, today. As Peoria continues to grow and mature, it is so important for us to keep an eye on our economic possibilities. And for that, that means for our city, access to high quality jobs and expanding our different opportunities for such areas as retail, restaurant and full service lodging. To be successful at something like that means working with the right business partners, maximizing our most strategic land and building a shared vision. And nowhere is that better illustrated than in the P83 area here at the city where we have all of the ingredients to make really a special product. After an extensive evaluation internally, we think we found the excellent partner to deliver on this promise. And to elaborate, I'll invite Katie Gregory, our Deputy City Manager, and Rick Buss, our Economic Development Director, to discuss our effort and also to induce, introduce our illustrious guests. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the council. It's, it's, council, it's my pleasure tonight to bring forward for your consideration this evening um, a memorandum of understanding for the Stadium Point project, which is located on 17 acres of, city, of city-owned land in the heart of the city's P83 district. This site is one of the city's premier and strategic sites and has long been identified as a key employment, shopping, dining, recreation, and entertainment area. As you know and probably feel, there's a real sense of energy surrounding Stadium Point. And while we have always known that and have always felt that this area was special and ripe for development, we're now also learning that many others feel that way as well and believe <laughs> that now is the time for the Stadium Point project uh, to move forward. So across the region, we are getting lots of interest in Stadium Point, which I think is, is new and, and, and a little different than maybe in the past. Uh, the city council has set a very high standard for what it expects at the Stadium Point project. Um, this site will serve as a catalyst in the West Valley and create an economic generator uh, that will attract, attract advanced industry, high wage jobs, and create a dynamic, energetic, and distinctive environment uh, for people to live, work, and play. The project as proposed is a vertical mixed use project that would include true class A, uh, office space, parking garages, full service hotel, multifamily, res multifamily residential, public plaza and event stay space, retail dining and entertainment. <clears throat> the Stadium Point project area has been established as the opportune site for this type of development due to its freeway accessibility, its strategic location within the region and its the highly skilled workforce living within the, the commute shed. We continue to see strong demand for Class A office and related amenities, and I think you will see with the upcoming renderings that have been provided by our partner uh, that the proposed iconic design will showcase the P83 district in a way that is uniquely Peoria. I'm gonna have Rick just talk a little bit as, as Jeff, enter, um, Jeff um, uh, spoke about the RFP process and what we were looking for with the RFP. All right, oh, I could use the clicker? You Thank can you. use the clicker. Very exciting. So the, the, the uh, mayor and council, the purpose of the RFP was to translate this vision and this energy that we knew was, exists into an RFP. But I, I'll preface that by saying that we just didn't develop an RFP overnight. We spent a lot of time not only looking at the important parts of that vision, but also looking at who's out there. Uh, we spent a lot of time in market research, a lot of reach outs between different channel markets, that type of thing. I would say well over 100,000 touch points through places like the ULI, NAOP, that type of thing, as well as our uh, C2B program. Uh, we held a pre-application uh, proposal meeting and we had about 70 folks that uh, attended both virtually as in, in person. And we ended up with having uh, four applicants and uh, we think we've found the right one sitting here tonight, which I will not let a person surprise because Katie gets to do that. So very quickly, the RFP that we were looked at a master developer that is an all-in-one solution, one that can fund design, construct, and operate. And that operate portion is very important because that means they're here for the long term. And uh, we want very much look for a partner. 
We looked for fully assembled development teams, those that have experience in doing this type of project. Um, have those relationships and the funding. That's very important for a project this size, because typically these projects are not, you know, are largely equity financed, and that relationships are extremely important in the um, equity markets. And then somebody that can execute immediately, because you know I, I think we share our, our vision to move quickly on this as possible. So some of the time I talked a little bit about the market research and the pre-marketing. Uh, we issued the RFP um, over the last, uh, say, two months, uh, a little bit delayed with the COVID. Uh, we've been discussing some due diligence items with uh, uh, our, our friends here sitting at the dais, and um, we're now at the MOU stage. Um, and is this where the magic yes. comes? So we're gonna, Katie did this. So I'd like to introduce to you American Life. Uh, Katie's gonna do a little more of an intro than I am. But tonight's about the MOU um, to enable us to move forward in a development agreement, which is the details um, for uh, moving forward. Of course, then you go through design, construction, and then operating it. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Katie. Thank you. So. so this brings us to our development partner, um, American Life's president, Mr. Greg Steinhauer. He's created a portfolio of projects that speak to his core competency of integrating mixed-use projects near stadiums that host professional sporting events. Uh, Greg's gonna share a little bit about his company and his team, and on that note, part of his team, we have Arthur Chang, who's here as well. He is the director of design for Freiheit Architecture, and Arthur has worked with American Life on a number of significant projects, and with his team has created a vision that incorporates the elements of the broader P83 district, and we wanted him here tonight to kind of share with you some of that vision uh, in the design. So with that, I wanted to hand it over to Arthur, I mean, excuse me, to Greg, and let him talk a little bit about his team and about uh, who American Life is. If you wanna give that Thank to Arthur, you. you can, or you can. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Honorable Council members. members. Uh, thank you for having us tonight. My name is Greg Steinhauer. I'm president of American Life. Uh, myself and my wife, Debbie, behind me, we are uh, Seattle refugees. <laughs> we just spent uh, 22 hours driving down from Seattle, and we are making uh, Arizona our permanent residence. So we're committed here for the long run. Um, American Life is, a, for now, we're a Seattle-based real estate developer. Uh, we've had, a, we've been around since 1996. We've had a, uh, we have a portfolio of about a billion and a half dollars. Our core competency is developing urban complex projects, uh, office, hotel, and mixed-use projects. The uh, attraction here at P83 well, before I get into that, I, I would like to uh, compliment your whole team. Uh, I've built in a variety of jurisdictions, and I have to tell you from Jeff, Katie, Rick, Jan, uh, Sonia, city attorney, they're superb, they're, and you should be very proud of them. Uh, they've been totally transparent. Christine Finney also, who ran the uh, RFP process, it was a totally transparent process, and uh, they're excellent, so I, I would just like to compliment them, and um, you're very lucky to have them. And I don't recall ever doing the Pledge of Allegiance <laughs> at a City of Seattle Council meeting. So, uh, we're excited about this. My wife and I came down here uh, for a month in March when COVID hit, and if my excitement level was here before, it's up here now, because, uh, as a real estate developer, you're always looking for patterns uh, and seeing what's, what's going on. And there's just uh, a big hole in the marketplace here. And this, is, this area is so primed, uh, there's just there's something missing here. And, and our goal here is to create a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, Arthur will explain the plan in a few minutes here. But along with my uh, colleague, Rory Sandstrom, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, we came up with a strategy. The, the first thing you have to solve is the parking issue. As you all know, the project's burdened by, we have to replace roughly 1,500 parking stalls to serve uh, the baseball stadium. Fortunately, we have a very good relationship with the Seattle Mariners because we developed a project right across the street from Safeco Field. And we also have a, developed a project in the parking lot of the Seahawks Stadium 
$350 million project. So we understand how crowds work, how sports work, but the stadium, uh, I want to be real clear, the stadium is a, not the draw for this project. The project's going to be a draw unto itself, and the stadium simply enhances what we're going to bring to the table with the project and just create that much more energy. So uh, we're living in a very interesting time, as we all know, and we think it's actually going to help us, uh, not hurt us, because we see this as a, what's going to happen in our belief is that people are going to want to move out of the West Coast cities, Seattle, LA, uh, San Francisco, and develop nodes of office tenants, that type of thing. Or there's plenty of tenants here. Uh, on our team, we have the best aid, uh, commercial agent here in uh, the Phoenix area. And then uh, we've also partnered with our longtime agents out of Seattle who's brought in many tech tenants. So we have exposure to all the tech tenants and the local knowledge here. So we're just very excited about the opportunity. And with that, I will turn it over to Arthur. Arthur and I have worked together uh, since we both had hair 30 <laughs> years ago. Um, Arthur won't say it, but, but he's, a, he's a brilliant architect. He has a degree in uh, aer aeronautical engineering and a master's degree in architecture from Columbia. And uh, just, I, I throw my hands up like this and say, Arthur, how about if we do this? And then he comes up with the ideas and makes them work. So thank you very much, Arthur. Yeah, we're gonna do in the flies someday. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Greg. Um, I'm really excited about this project and I could probably talk about it all night long but I've been told to keep it to the high level stuff, so that's what I'm gonna to do tonight. Um, these are slides that we put together when we interviewed for the project, and uh, one of the things that we talked about when we interviewed are the three most critical things that drew, drove our project. And we think these three things set us apart from most of the other people developing or proposing to develop at the site. Um, I think at now, looking at the title that we have on the slide, I would change it from design goals paramount to economic size to goals paramount to long-term economic success. In 28 years that I've known Greg, he's always been visionary in trying to think ahead and try to plan for something that other people don't see. And we've seen it in all the projects he's done in Seattle, and this project is no different. One of the key things of the three points I'm gonna make is that this project needs to be a catalyst for the future growth. And we're not just talking about the 17 acres that we have here, we're talking about the whole P83 district and the city of Peoria. Um, what I'm going to share with you next is some very not exciting slides because they're sketches that I did at the very beginning of this project um, to, to get started. Um, but I think they help tell the story of how we approach the project and what we find important. So what we did at the very beginning of the project, we downloaded the Google map of the P83 district. And what I did is I just took a marker and I just color coded um, what the uses are in the P83 district. And uh, in this uh, diagram, basically, the yellow is retail, the pink is office, and the red is hospitality, and then you've got the sports complex in the middle. And so you can see that you guys already have a very healthy mixed-use neighborhood to start out right now. Um, it's a really great start. Um, the next thing we looked at is how does it circulate, and it's basically, um, it's an auto-oriented uh, kind of um, retail along two major arterials is kind of the straightforward way to describe it. I'm sure there's some more complexities to it, but if we're just kind of look at it from really big picture, that's what we have. And then the next thing we looked at is we looked at what areas are likely to get redeveloped sometime in the future. Um, and we don't know how far in the future these things will happen at, but things like uh, you have a movie theater complex and movie theaters may not be around in the near future um, with the way things are going. You have some dated um, strip retail centers. And so we don't know when that's going to get redeveloped, but we ought to look forward to the future of when it does, what we can do to set it up for the right kind of development pattern when it does happen. Um, and then at the heart of it, um, highlighted in green, is basically the major league um, sports complex, um, which kind of is a special kind of note that makes this neighborhood um, unique. So the idea we had was, identifying the areas that are likely to get redeveloped in the near future, 
figuring out a way we can create a spine, connect all those together, and then try to break the scale down to a little bit more of a pedestrian um, scale so that in the future we can create a neighborhood where people would want to go and spend time. And our idea is that our project would be the catalyst that sets the tone for that, basically. And it's a future vision that may take many years to get to, but it's something we need to start now um, and, um, and set the right tone, looking forward to that idea. And if we do it right, hopefully what it'll do is just seed the idea that there's gonna be other nodes that'll be created that will create that whole environment and, the, and in the future, you will have a, a P83 that is actually walkable, that actually has a sense of place that will be something special that would be the heart of Peoria in many ways. And that is our vision uh, moving ahead. Uh, so that was the first point, is that this needs to be a catalyst for change. And the 17 acres may sound like a really large project, but really for this project to be successful, we feel like it really needs to invigorate the whole environment that's around it. And for successful doing that, it will float all boats and this will be even more successful as we move ahead. Uh, the second point, and my phone went dead <laughs> while I was talking. And give me just one second here. The second point that we wanna talk about and to get to some of our more exciting images is that we really need to create an authentic sense of, sense of place, okay? And what we're not going to do is we're not gonna take some other successful project that we did somewhere else and plop it down in Peoria. What we need to do is we need to find something that's unique to Peoria, because that's why people come to this, is if it's authentic and it's the one experience that you can get in Peoria. I will be the first to admit, we have not done that yet with our renderings and everything else, because we have not spent the time to get to know Peoria, because we only had a few weeks to put this together. But that's one of the promises that we were gonna to make to you is that we're gonna spend the time to get to know Peoria and figure out what makes it special. And then we're gonna put that layer of Peoria on this because we think that making this place authentic is really critical. Um, so what we're proposing is basically a mixed use complex in this 17 acres. And one of the key things for this in this area that you see for this is that the center at the heart of it is creating a public realm. This is not a private project and everything else. This is a place where people can come and spend time and make memories, basically. That's what we want to have happen. Um, one of the things that we spent a lot of time thinking about for that is how do we make this into this public realm? And we looked at the, the different types of transportation and how circulation works. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep the automobile wheels to the outside of the project um, and create a pedestrian zone in the middle of the project where it's walkable. Um, and so to that effect, you can see in this analysis, basically we're keeping the arterials on the outside of the project. We're actually creating uh, nodes for multimodal access on the outside because we think transportation is gonna change this. And we're also trying to look at and analyze how traffic is moving to and from the stadium and make sure that when we do have events that the pieces and parts that we put in can still function while there's an event going on. Um, one of the reasons why we're proposing so many different uses is that we want this to be a 24-hour um, complex. There's people going to be living here, there's, there's hotels. We want it so that there's always eyes on the street so this becomes a safe place and it's always occupied. Um, in this rendering, this is kind of a bird's eye, but you can see uh, the hotel and that we might even have a, like a bar at the top of the hotel that could see into the stadium. So there's eyes looking out everywhere and there's different scales on the different streets um, in order to create um, intimacy at some levels and then broader kind of venues where you could have and stage different types of events um, in, in, in the kind of the heart of the center. That's another one of the things that as we move ahead with this project, uh, we would try to identify what kind of opportunities there are to partnership with the city in order to make spaces that we can be used in different ways. Um, I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but you know, this project has a lot of different scales to it. Um, the main kind of commons area is quite large scale, but we are doing a lot of side streets and we're very, can be very critical about how we interface with each one of the different compartments of the, uh, the neighborhood. Um, in this rendering that you're looking at right now, this is one of the side streets where the scale gets down a little bit lower, but we're also thinking about doing things like doing live work units that come down to the street that face the stadium so that each one of the borders actually has a different character that faces, that's appropriate to whatever it faces. And then, of course, the main, another goal, this is the view from the 101, basically, 
And we, on purpose, put some height into this project because we want this to be a beacon um, and to be something that people can see so that it has a regional draw versus just being something that's local. And then um, the common space, we, this is really the heart of the project. And um, we can't be said enough times that we are gonna do something with the programming that's gonna make this special. We've shown a lot of things to show activity right now, but one of the things as we move ahead is that we want to find something unique um, to occupy this space that will draw people. And again, this is where we see people coming and spending time. And if I haven't made this clear enough in this presentation, we are really trying to do something different than what P83 is right now. We're trying to create something that's pedestrian oriented where people will come not because it's a destination to run an errand, but come to explore and create new memories and explore. And I think that's what is kind of missing in order to create more regional draw. Um, and this final slide has all the different types of uses labeled, and I'm not gonna go through all of them. Um, but it kind of goes to my last point, um, is that this project has to maintain flexibility. We have very carefully, um, in slides that we're not showing to you tonight, um, talked about how we're gonna phase this project. And it's a very large project, and what we've done is broken it down into pieces, and this is probably gonna take many years to complete. We expect course corrections to happen, things like pandemics to happen, things that will happen that we can't expect that might change um, what we expect and how we build things. But I can tell you that from working with 28 years with um, Greg, that Greg's actually very good at building in a little bit of extra insurance to make sure that the buildings work um, for when we get to the time that we need to. Um, in Seattle, we did this one project. Um, it was one of our first large projects, and Greg came to me and said, hey, I'm not really sure what the future for this is. Most people were building just kind of straight office, mm -hmm. and we actually engineered a building with a little bit larger heights, a little bit more load-bearing uh, floors, uh, a little bit extra um, redundancy for the power systems, um, and we actually put in an extra freight elevator. And then at the time, I was asking him, well, what, why are we doing all of this? Because we could just get an office tenant. And Greg said, well, we don't know that for sure. What we ended up doing in that building is we ended up putting in a data center. We ended up doing a research and development um, team. We ended up filling it with so many things because Greg went the extra little bit of developing a building that was flexible enough to accommodate changing uses. In this project, we expect to do the same thing. Um, as Greg kind of alluded to earlier, this project is really dominated by parking because of the situation with the stadium um, that we're at. But in the future, we can see that there might not be as much of a need to parking at some day if autonomous parking um, starts to become a little bit of a more of a thing. Uh, so what we're probably gonna do on this project is we're gonna develop all the parking garages so they can be reconfigured into other uses. So we are not gonna do the sloped parking garages. We're gonna try to do them as flat plates. We're probably gonna do them a little bit of extra height and we'll probably do them so that, um, engineer them a little bit higher so they can take the loads for other uses so that we're looking toward the future and saying, hey, if things change, these buildings will be resilient and we'll be able to reuse them. That is probably the thing that we can do that's the most sustainable for the future is build buildings that last so we don't have to take them down and build them again. Um, those are the main points for the project um, moving ahead. I'm sure there's a thousand questions that we can answer, um, but we are really excited to do this project and partner with the city. Um, the staff has been incredible and we're really looking forward to working together with you. And we'll open up to questions. Actually, I have a couple more slides. Just oh, want to talk sure. about that, but I I'll don't know. I'll pass that back to you. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, real quickly, just uh, so tonight, what we're asking council to do is to actually approve a memorandum of understanding um, with American Life. Uh, the purpose of our MOU is to set kind of the, the go forward direction and the general understanding that we have um, to form the basic terms and arrangements that we're going to have for a development agreement, which would be, if you remember on Rick's slide, is kind of the next step is to create a development agreement with, with American Life. So I want to just talk a little bit about some of the key provisions that we have uh, in the MOU. Uh, first is on land conveyance. Obviously, this is a city-owned site, so land uh, conveyance will probably be a, a pretty uh, key term as part of this uh, the, the uh, development agreement, which would include potentially negotiated purchases or long-term leases. 
um, or a combination of purchase and lease, and then also provide some options for purchase and lease of individual pads or subdivided parcels. Uh, we would include, uh, the city will bring the site. One of the provisions is that the city is going to bring the site to construction ready condition. That does include moving a existing well site that is on the property. Many of you probably have seen that there. Um, it stipulates that the city and the developer will prepare a master plan or a master development plan that addresses the project phasing, which I'll show in just a moment, and some of the infrastructure requirements that are gonna be required as part of that. It considers a future collaboration on other city properties, as, as um, Arthur kind of showed. There's multiple nodes that are of interest in the P83 district area. Um, so it, does, it will consider a potential future collaboration on that if certain timelines and benchmarks are met on the existing project. And the MOU establishes timelines for the completion and approval of the site plan and associated construction documents, as well as the overall project phases and the full completion of the project. So all of those are identified in the MOU that we're asking council to consider this evening. Um, on this slide, just to kind of discuss the, the phasing, uh, we are looking at about a four-phased project. Um, it's the contemplated phasing at this point and the associated asset classes that would go with that. As you can see, um, in phase one, we want to be able to get the site ready for construction. Let's get everything done that we need to get done to start that first um, class A office space, retail dining, parking structure, and really get that, that first phase started. What's unique about this is that the intent is to be able to design this in a way that if at any point in any of the phases uh, there is a, a, a gap that occurs because we're not assuming any gap, but if one occurred, that we want each phase to stand on its own um, and be an important phase in the event that, um, you know, for some reason we can't move to the second phase or milestones aren't met or something. So, so the agreement would contemplate off-ramps if we needed them, but also um, the phasing that we have in here. We anticipate about an 84-month completion, which is seven years. So sometimes that's hard to hear, but projects of this size and this type um, are going to take time, and these phasings um, every 24 months or so getting phases going. Doesn't mean we can't overlap some phases. Sounds like Greg likes to move things along, but... Um, but we're, we're contemplating about a seven year uh, for full project completion. So you can see phase three would include the hotel, vertical multifamily, retail dining and entertainment, and phase four would finish off a second class A building with a parking structure, finish off the multifamily, and again, the retail dining and entertainment. And to um, Arthur's point earlier, obviously some, uh, you know, there may be some flexibility in there depending upon what um, what is going on at the time, but this is, but we are clear on what phase, the first phase of development will include class A office um, and the parking structure so that we need to make sure that that's included. And that's part of the MOU as a specific term. So with that, I'm happy um, if you have any questions for uh, Greg or Arthur, or if you have any questions of Rick and I, we're happy to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you, council. Any questions? Council Member Patena? Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Mr. Steinauer, thank you for being here today, and Arthur, you as well. Um, I have a question. Um, this, uh, this project has been on uh, this council's front burner for quite a while, and uh, we have had, I believe, two previous developers come in, uh, but they were unable to move this project forward. What will you do differently, and what gives you confidence that you will be able to move this project forward? Excellent question. And my short answer is because we've done it before. Um, we, every project that we've done, major project with Arthur, uh, they were just empty parking lots. Uh, the first question when we did the Red Cross Safeco Field, who's gonna move the office down here? Why would you do this? Now it's one of the great office projects in the city campuses. We're getting high rents. We have blue chip, we, we have you know, great Facebook, Amazon, uh, the US government. Uh, we just have some great tenants down there. And then in the north lot of the Seahawks Stadium, it was a big empty parking lot. Uh, we leased 200,000 square feet. Before we were done, we spec the building. And now it's a uh, iconic part of the city. And then down in LA, when we built a, uh, down at LA Live, right there in the heart of the city, we started a 400 room hotel. We were the first crane up post recession, uh, the last recession. 
not the depression. Um, and uh, we, we had a very successful project there. So we've seen it. And I, I just, I think we have a formula, all things considered, that if, if you create the right product, you bring the right team together, including the city, and, and you're, you want to be the best at whatever you're doing, that you'll succeed. <clears throat> Councilmember Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Great presentation. Um, as Councilman Patena said, you know, we've all been waiting a long time for something like this to, to come to Peoria, and I think this could be it. I, I'm hoping that it is it. Um, I, had a, I had a couple questions, not necessarily for you, but maybe for Katie. So what are we doing? Um, you know, we have all of our trail systems. Are we going to be working on our trails along the, the river there to connect this project to the river system? Because as we're talking about livability and wanting to get people to get out and experience this, situ this uh, environment, we need to uh, uh, make sure that we're tapping into our trails so that the residents on the other side of the river can come visit this and the business owners and the occupants of these businesses can take full advantage of the amenities that we have to offer. How are we gonna do that? So, uh, Mayor, uh, Council Member Edwards, um, that's a great question as well. And actually one of the items that really um, intrigued us with American Life as they did their presentation is they didn't leave that part out. Um, they actually considered the trail system, they considered all the pedestrian ways in which people might enter into the P83 district and how they, were, how they see on a long-term vision how they might see those, those interactions occur. Um, we do, we, I, I agree with you, we have a, a wonderful amenity along uh, Skunk Creek uh, and on the north edge of Skunk Creek that's more adjacent to the, to the stadium, we might have some opportunities there and some other nodes within there to create um, a very uh, inviting and other development that's occurring along that uh, that can help in create an inviting uh, entryway into the P83 district. Uh, we've been working with ASU on a project with, about Skunk Creek to try to look at what are those opportunities, what might that look like, how do we, how do we engage the residents that are on the south side of Skunk Creek into uh, P83 without requiring them to go to 83rd Avenue or 75th potentially, or if they do, that they have an entryway in maybe from the, the back side of the stadium. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. We don't have specific projects outlined right now, um, but as we see and as we talk more with Arthur and, and um, with Greg about the vision of this project, you know, I think we're going to gain some insights as to how we can make some of those connections, how those are going to work, and then what types of uh, what types of interest do we have in trying to create some of those uh, as new development comes into the area and as well as with this development, planning for that at least for the future. Thank you. I really liked your comment about, you know, getting to know Peoria better. I hope that you do get to know Peoria because we have some phenomenal people yeah. in this city and I, I hope you can talk to as many of them as you can to find out exactly what makes us so special because we all know what it is, but <laughs> we want you to know as well. And then I really liked your, your comment about the um, modes of transportation as, you know, as the ways are, are changing, you know, cars, autonomous cars are coming into play um, and making it walkable. I really like your comments about that and I hope that somewhere down the line, if, if, we, if you guys recognize it, Tra or the, the parking structures are not needed. What are the other uh, modes of transportation that are gonna get people to and from that location? So I'm really interested to see how, how you guys are gonna work on that. So, thank if, you, Mayor. If I may just make one more comment, because I think this is really important. Because we develop around the West Coast, and you, you live in this city, your whole focus is this city, but if you step back a minute and look uh, more globally at the Peoria as a city. Earlier today, or tonight, we saw uh, approximately 5,000 5, houses are gonna be built, right? And just ballpark, they're all under $500,000, okay? On the west, major West Coast cities, Seattle, San Francisco, Southern California, you can't touch a brand new house with, uh, for $500,000. You have, Peoria has a fabulous school system and uh, lots of amenities. So you have this whole population, and especially after COVID, this is one of the things we're going to see. They're going to, and, and working remotely. Why the heck are we going to be spending our entire paycheck on our house? We can come here, we can have a great quality of life, and this is going to be a tremendous attraction to employers. 
I'm very confident in that, even more so now than before. The reason they're not here is because there's nothing, nothing's been offered to them. But when they see this, they're going to jump on it. I'm, I'm so confident in that. So, and we have your rooftop bar, Mayor. <laughs> I saw it. I saw it. Nice. Councilmember Hunt. Well, thank you for that wonderful presentation, and thank you for the vision that you have uh, for Peoria, and also your insight into understanding what a special place this is. Did I understand you're moving here? Correct. Wonderful. Uh, you will get to know us then, and I, I think it's the happiest place on earth. I really do. We, we have a lot of everything, and, and you're going to bring just the element that we've waited for, and this has been a long time coming, and I want to say thank you to Rick and to Katie and uh, Jen and uh, Scott back there. I know many of you have worked on this over the years, and I think we've got a winner here. I just am really excited about, like I said, your vision and, and also uh, your past history, your ability to perform. So welcome. If there's anything else we can do for you, I'm sure we'll be willing to do it. Thank you very Thank much. You. And, and we're here with open ears, right? We've, we've worked with your team. They've had a lot of input to this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just want to make it collectively the best project that we can. In, in all of Maricopa County. That's that's really our goal. So Councilmember Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Um, welcome to Peoria. I don't I don't think you will regret this decision. Um, finding the right partner for this area, for this development is is long overdue. And I I concur with uh, the thoughts um, that the other council members have expressed. You had mentioned, you know, not about why they haven't come. I think a big reason why they haven't come is, um, you know, we just haven't had the right development in place, but Class A office space is absolutely key uh, for what we want to build for our city moving forward. That is going to be key. So I love that that is in the first phase of this project. I think that's really important. Uh, I also really appreciate the fact that you're talking about a long-term sustainable project that we can grow into and the potential of what can happen with these structures and the surrounding area. And that's um, just a very realistic approach to this. I can't stress enough how eyes and ears will be on us, all of us, as we move forward with this because of what we've been through in the past. So mm -hmm. I am really excited about everything that you're sharing here and look forward to more conversation and lots of questions and all of that. A quick question for you, uh, Katie. So today we're looking at the MOU. Um, will the development agreement come before us? In, uh, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, any development agreement would have to come before Just the council for approval, and we are um, targeting um, sometime before the end of the calendar year to have a development agreement in place. Still have some work to do, lots of infrastructure associated with this project, yeah. clearly lots of um, assets and, and some complexity that we need to work through, but um, we do plan to have a development agreement before this council before the end of the year. Great. Thank you. If I can add, uh, council, Mayor and Council Member, uh, that doesn't mean we're waiting to have the development agreement to move forward. So we're already working on pitch decks to do co-marketing. Co um, the Class A office space, as you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, in the last 18 months uh, through GPAC, we've had 941,000 square feet requested. And in this time, people are saying, well, hey, is that slowed down? In the last three weeks, we've had 250,000 and 170,000. So the demand continues. Uh, the most Commercial real estate um, professionals are thinking that it's going to continue to go. Not all of them, but we feel that way. We also think, uh, to Greg's point, is you have a lower cost of uh, li uh, living here, a low cost of doing business. You have lower regulation. And it's also a geographic hedge strategy for a lot of these corporations that have all been in one spot. And so the ability to diversify outside of their markets um, is, is a becoming more and more attractive. So we're doing a lot of our co-marketing materials along those lines. So. And one other simple fact is the Phoenix area, as you all know, is the fastest growing area in the United States, right? right. So uh, once you have that momentum, it's really hard to stop it. And uh, momentum creates momentum. And so 
that's just another uh, thing to be excited about. Thank you. And there are many, many things to be excited about tonight. I have to say that, you know, when we first met, um, I don't know how many months ago now it was when we met at the sports complex, I really felt like there was a connection. I really felt like you had um, an understanding of who we are or let me put it this way. I felt like there was a definite compatibility in who we are and who you are. And so I'm very, very pleased that tonight has finally come to fruition. And I know I have to wait longer in 24 month increments, but I'm not very patient. So I hope those can go Neither faster than the past has been. Um, I, was, I was really pleased to see your uh, proposal, your response, and you clearly had uh, our vision in your mind when you were um, creating this, what I call a very urban design in the city of Peoria. For a long time, we have known of all of the assets of the city of Peoria, but it has been really our little secret. Uh, not very many other people can, can see it. They, they just didn't have the foresight to understand that we have the workforce and we have the needs and um, that we have the environment and the desire to change the bedroom community portion of our city into a place where our residents can really stay all day long and work and still get to their kids' games, um, you know, at a good, at a decent hour in the evening and not have to spend all of their time on the freeway. Uh, that's what our residents want. They want to transform our city into a place where they can get all of their needs met here. And you are creating an environment that is going to be exactly that for our 180,000 residents that we currently have, let alone all of the rest um, from the home builders that are, that are expected to come, and that is just a few of them. Because as you know, uh, we have only built out half of our city. And so not only are we um, going to be a magnet for the region and the Southwest, uh, we, are, we are going to be just a huge, huge asset for the citizens of Peoria who want to have a richer, fuller life. This will develop that for them. So it is more than buildings and it is more than just amenities uh, in the middle. It really is going to change how people live and feel in the city of Peoria. So for that, we are very thankful and we're very grateful that you're the ones who are here and I meant to say hello to your wife too, as we were as we were speaking. It was um, it's wonderful to see you both here, and it's and, and Arthur too. It's very glad I'm very glad to be able to get to know all of you and know that you care deeply for the outcome and your impact in Peoria. Thank you. So we thank you, and we look forward to a um, development agreement very quickly. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. And with that, I think we ought to take a vote. Do we have a motion on this MOU? There's a motion second. and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get to work. There we go. <laughs> All right, we are moving past 37 and on to 38. This is Peoria Place, planned area development amendment near Grand Avenue and Cotton Crossing. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you. And Chris Hawkes, our planning development director, will present an ordinance for your consideration uh, to approve an amendment for the Peoria Place planned area development zoning entitlement. Yeah, good evening, Mayor and Council. Wow, what, a, what an exciting presentation that was. Mm -hmm. Well, now we're going to talk about another uh, public-private partnership here in the city. So in a minute, I'm going to turn it over to Scott White. Um, he'll talk about the origination of this case. He is, of course, from City of Peoria's Real Estate Development Office. And so um, this was a very strategically positioned parcel. It's about 125 acres. It's near Old Town. Of course, with the entry of the MIHS facility, it's changed the whole complexion of this area. So very strategically positioned parcel. Uh, Scott's office, they approached the landowner, Highland Capital, and the representative. And over the last year, working with uh, city departments, we've collaborated on trying to reposition this um, older uh, zoning entitlement into something that responds to today's market and will provide some, we hope, some synergy with, with Old Town and, and what's going on in the area. So with that, I'm going to turn it briefly over to Scott White. 
Great. Thank you, Chris and Mayor, City Council. Uh, it's a pleasure to be before you tonight. Um, the, Pure, the Peoria Place PAD amendment is a, is a great example of four themes that I'll touch on. Uh, one is partnership. Uh, two is collaboration. Three is the activation of a key parcel in the city uh, and doing that through a strategic approach. Uh, so in terms of partnership, um, I'd like to recognize and, and thank our external partners. Uh, external project partners uh, include representatives uh, representing or be on behalf of the property owner, Highland Capital. That includes Matt McGrainer, uh, who is a managing director of Next Point Real Estate Advisors, who's joining us tonight. Cody Morton, uh, also of Next Point Real Estate, is an advisor. Uh, DC Souter, uh, which is general counsel uh, to Next Point Real Estate Advisors. Um, their partnership and willingness to uh, help move this key property forward has been, has been wonderful, and so we're very thankful for your help in this. Um, in terms of the landowner's representative, um, on behalf of land advisors, uh, Mike Schwab, uh, who's also with us tonight. Uh, he's a principal and designated broker with Land Advisor um, and has been a wonderful partner uh, in, in helping move this through the process. Um, and of course, our, our anchor tenant for the property, uh, Valley Wise Health, formerly MIHS, uh, Warren Whitney, uh, is with us tonight, uh, Senior Vice President of Governmental Relations. Uh, those are our external project partners. We also have some internal project partners that I would really like to recognize, and that is our planning department. Um, Real Estate Development Office worked very closely and well with the planning department, very appreciative of all their help uh, and guidance uh, as we went through this process. The engineering department, both on the site development side and the traffic engineering side, uh, thank you very much for your help in that. Uh, Public Works Department on transit planning uh, was, was very helpful in our city attorney's office. Um, we also had other partners, our surrounding community, um, with our community meetings and making sure we were sensitive to their issues going forward. And of course, the Peoria Unified School District in terms of understanding what their needs are and concerns might be relative to this changing entitlement. So that's, that's our, our partnership package. Uh, in terms of collaboration, uh, you know, we also have uh, this whole effort towards putting a long idled property into productive economic use. Um, and so I'll just touch on two key things that I'm sure Chris will elaborate on. Uh, the redistribution of land uses within the existing entitlement was very important. Uh, the existing entitlement has about 80% of the entitlement in uh, multifamily housing. Uh, we felt that this property could definitely support employment generating uses, um, such as medical office, such as commercial, such as retail and industrial. Um, so the redistribution of land use was, was very important, uh, as well as updating the development standards and the circulation um, so that we could meet the high quality standards and the goals of development uh, set by the city council. Chris, as, as the prior slide might suggest, uh, we also have in the Real Estate Development Office a, a full team. Um, Decker Parrish Sabatini is a full service planning firm. Kimley Horn is a full service civil engineering firm. So we can originate various documents uh, and, and help towards activating uh, the, these properties, uh, the strategic properties throughout the city. So as the next slide will show, uh, there was quite the work plan for us to get going on, to, to get to tonight. Um, you know, negotiating with the property owner to move towards development. Uh, as we know, it's been long idled, um, but happy to say uh, after a three-year journey, we're, we're, we're now moving forward uh, with, a, with a positive development. Creating a development program for the site was, was really the first thing, and that started in 2017. You know, attracting the anchor tenant now value-wise, then MIHS was hugely important for the site. Um, confirming all the industrial and commercial office market data, you know, creating conceptual land use plans, and negotiating land use plans and land, land use matrices, uh, initiating the PAD amendment, you know, creating density models and site plans, and finally submitting the draft, the community meeting, resubmitting, and now finally planning commission earlier this, this uh, month and now before you tonight. So it's been a long journey, um, but I think we're finally almost there. Um, and so I just wanna thank our partners uh, for the collaboration and uh, look forward to new development coming to Southern Peoria. 
So with that, let me turn it back over to Chris, uh, who will talk about the planning side. Great. Well, thank you, Scott. That was, a, that was a great introduction. So now what we'll do is just take a, a little closer look at the property and the proposed entitlement. Again, this is an amendment to the existing PAD zoning for Peoria Place that's been in place since 2006. Uh, the site's identified in yellow on the screen, um, 125 acres in size. Uh, contextually uh, to the uh, Grand Avenue is the northern boundary of it. North of Grand Avenue, of course, is the Super Walmart. There are some outlying neighborhoods and then Santa Fe Elementary School. Uh, to the south of the site is, um, well, it says Madison Estates, but I believe it's signed as Pinecrest. I believe that's a neighborhood. And then Roundtree Ranch is also to the south of it. Um, along the um, southern and eastern portion along Grand Avenue, um, there are some light industrial manufacturing or warehouse uses. And then west of the site, of course, is the Peoria City Hall. That triangular parcel, I'll talk about that in a minute, but that is uh, west of Cotton Crossing, uh, directly adjacent to the Old Town area. The major access points, of course, into Peoria Place, uh, as you know, Grand Avenue, um, 83rd Avenue and Cotton Crossing. Whitney Drive is a, is a collector that um, uh, transects the site and turns into 79th. 79th and Olive is a currently signalized intersection. Okay, as Scott indicated, the purpose of this entitlement was, um, again, the, the current entitlement I'll talk about in a minute just for um, reflection, but it was done in uh, 2006. The entry of Valleywise really changed the complexion of this area. Um, and so the purpose of this was to um, completely restructure the entitlement for today um, and try to provide some synergy with uh, around Valleywise and also an Old Town area. So this is a brand new PAD, PAD that you'll see that um, completely repositioned some of those land uses. Scott mentioned that the prior PAD was about 82% of the land area was residential. Now it's about 43%. Um, additionally, the, the development standards have been adjusted to respond to the new land uses. Um, there are now the entry of design guidelines, and some of these design guidelines go a little bit beyond our current design guidelines, and they try to really um, um, reinforce the importance of placemaking and having um, good connectivity between these parcels as well. And also, I think another um, important item that you'll see on the plan is that uh, Whitney Drive, there is a proposal to um, redirect that uh, through the triangular parcel into Old Town to not only improve pedestrian and transit access in the future, but provide a front door for the Old Town area. Right now, it's a little circuitous from 83rd Avenue around the traffic circle, and we're hoping that uh, a more direct route provides that uh, better synergy between both sides. Okay, so just uh, as a basis of reflection, this is the current PAD that was done in 2006 with Wright Path Limited. Uh, again, this is predominantly residential. If you focus on that triangular parcel that's in purple, that was uh, designated for office uses there. Um, parcels two and three, which are the ones in orange, um, that was a combination of medium density residential and low density residential. Parcel four, that yellow strip, that was adjacent to Roundtree Ranch. So that was basically a edge condition that, that replicated what Roundtree Ranch density was. Parcels five, six, and seven is where you'll see the major changes that I'll show tonight. Those parcels at that time were designated for high density residential, for sort of multifamily type of development. And then the, uh, what is that, maroon? I guess it's maroon in parcel eight. Um, that was designated as uh, town center mixed use. So the town center mixed use parcel along with the office, um, the, the, the site plans and the development standards that were indicated in this entitlement really um, kind of turned its back on Old Town. They, they really um, fronted and faced, uh, embraced Cotton Crossing. So it was very two disparate developments. And I think what you'll see with the new plan is a very different, uh, different result. All right, so on to the new. Um, parcels one and two, that's, in, that's the triangular area in pink there. That's what we're calling Old Town Mixed Use. It's about eight acres. You can see, of course, the proposed Whitney Drive um, bisection of that area. Um, this is what we see as a continuation of Old Town. So not only the scale, the heights of buildings, but also the form. When I talk about development form, we're talking about buildings that embrace the street, that have little setbacks, that uh, really are a continuation of what you see in Old Town and the uses that you would expect in Old Town. Parcels three through five. Now, parcel three is in brown. That's what we're calling medium high density, 10 to 20 units per acre. So it can, it can uh, and, and what's envisioned is a whole range of product types, anything from uh, um, horizontal single family to your traditional multifamily development that could occur on that parcel. 
As you go to the south and you get to the orange or parcel four, that's more of a medium density residential. What's envisioned there is more of a uh, detached single family like you might expect at Pinecrest uh, to the west, uh, possibly duplexes or townhomes. And then that yellow strip parcel five, that again is a really a, a continuing replication of what you see at Roundtree Ranch with detached single family. Okay, with, um, if we cross over to 79th on the east side, Parcel six, which is the aqua, aqua area, that's envisioned as business park. This is the area that, uh, that is adjacent to those light industrial areas to the south and east and along Grand Avenue. This is envisioned more for um, office and business park, light manufacturing, um, with some support of retail and commercial services that would, that would uh, support those areas. Um, it's about 26 acres in size, and so one of the stipulations here is that it, we want it to be a, a, a true business park, and so there is a maximum of five acres that could be used for storage uses, but it's supposed to be mostly uh, planned and, and programmed for um, you know, business park and office uses. Parcel seven is the, uh, the blue in the middle. Um, that is the commercial retail parcel that's directly adjacent to the Valley Wise facility. We see office, restaurants, special retail. We understand that it's along a highway like Grand Avenue, but we want it to have um, really more of a, a reflection and uh, position based on placemaking. So while there is some ability to have some drive-through, there is a limitation on drive-throughs there because we want it to be uh, commercial offices and, and, and retail that support walking, that support uh, you know, the, uh, the activity that's gonna be adjacent to the Valley Wise facility. And then, of course, parcel eight, which is the current uh, facility that you see with a striped uh, pattern there. That's the, that's the Valley Wise facility parcel. This slide shows the circulation and pedestrian plan. I talked earlier about multiple points of access. Um, many of these points of access were, uh, were developed early on with the original entitlement. Of course, that entitlement hit the recession of 2007 and 8 and, and didn't move forward. Uh, this uh, proposal, as I mentioned, um, has Whitney Drive, um, proposes a realignment to Old Town, and so that's what you see that by section through parcels one and two. Um, there's also along um, Whitney Drive, which is the collector that goes to the middle of the parcel, there is also access, future access to Grand Avenue. Um, that's called Purdue Avenue. That's gonna be the future street of Purdue. The access there would be limited. Uh, the ADOT controls Grand Avenue and they have a limited access plan. Right now it would be right in, right out access. Um, any uh, uh, further access beyond that is dependent upon the use and a traffic study that uh, provides the warrants for ADOT and the city to approve greater access beyond what it is today. So that's a, that's a future conversation based on, on the land use and the product that we see out there. Um, also with uh, this uh, plan also envisions multiple um, circulation and pedestrian access points, not only between parcels, but also throughout the development um, and through adjoining outlying areas. As you've uh, come to know and expect, every uh, rezone has a public outreach process. We provide a notice of application at the beginning of the project and we provide a notice of hearing prior to its uh, going to planning commission and council. With this size of a project, we hit one quarter mile. That's the radius that we provide the, the, uh, the mailings to and all registered HOAs within a one mile area. We uh, had a neighborhood meeting on uh, September 25th. Uh, we had 19 property owners and tenants. We had a very good attendance there. Uh, many from the Roundtree Ranch area. The uh, comments that we heard at that meeting, there was uh, uh, co you know, comments and questions about how is the traffic generation gonna work? Is there gonna be an intersection at 83rd and Mountain, uh, Mountain View? The answer is potentially. There could potentially be uh, a lighted intersection also at Whitney and uh, Cotton Cross and a well. It's all gonna depend on the, uh, the traffic studies that will come as each parcel comes into fruition and the warrants that they, that they suggest. Um, there was also questions about pedestrian connections, uh, what were the, the impacts beyond existing neighborhoods, and what's the process and timing for this whole development to come to fruition. So through the life of this project, we have not uh, got any, um, uh, any stated uh, you know, op points of opposition. We did get one email that was of somebody was requesting additional information on the case, so we answered those questions. We've also got an email from the uh, Peoria Unified School District, and they have uh, verified that there is capacity within their school district, and they understand that as additional parcels come in, that we will we will be uh, um, working with the developer in the school district on uh, understanding their product type, their student generation, and um, additional uh, questions beyond that. 
This item went to the Planning and Zoning Commission on June 4th. Um, there were no members of the public present at that case. Uh, the commission uh, was very supportive of the project. They voted unanimously to recommend approval. So um, in summary, the, the findings that we have is that this proposal is in conformance not only with the general plan, but the old town specific area plan. We think it's definitely an improvement to the existing entitlement that it's in place. The development standards and the land use distributions are, are appropriate and responsive to uh, the, the new reality out there. The circulation plan creates a better gateway into Old Town, and so we'll have uh, just another point of entry into Old Town. And we believe the uh, conditions will, uh, um, and the necessary infrastructure will be constructed to maintain the network within this part of Peoria. So, Mayor and Council, with that, uh, our recommendation is that you approve the ordinance to um, update and approve the new entitlement. And with that, myself or Scott, I'm sure, is willing to take any questions you have. Thank you. Council, are there any questions, comments? Council Member Hunt? Did you know? Well, this one, too, has been a very long time coming. And uh, I, I couldn't be happier. And to those of you back there that are <clears throat> join, joining us in this project, welcome. You're you're very welcome, you're long overdue. So um, I, I love this project, the way it's been finessed and it's, very, it's been very malleable. Um, I'm happy for the residents, the surrounding residents' approval and acceptance. I've had a million questions over all these years about what's gonna go in there and when are the tumbleweeds gonna go away. And uh, so now I think we have some answers for them, and thank you, Scott. You've been so diligent on this. You and I have held hands over this project. I don't even want to think how many years. So um, just thank you, and I love the direction this is heading. Thank, thanks to you in the back also, all of you. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, well, I have to concur. It, it is really um, a great modernization of a plan that you know, was hit really hard by some economic conditions over and over and over again, and then a pandemic. So who knew, but it, it stood up to all of that. And in the meantime, we were happy, very, very happy to welcome Valley Wise. And we still are happy that you are there waiting for you to open um, as we get past this yet another hurdle that we have. Um, but I think that this is gonna be a, a great, um, amenity, the, the changes are, are going to amenitize the area all around you and so, and uh, as well as um, amenitizing the access into Old Town where we hope all of your employees will go every day at lunchtime. So uh, with that, I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve Ordinance 2020-09 as recommended by staff. Do you have a second? Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Scott, thank you for all of your years of work on this. <laughs> all right. And we will now move on to item 39R, West Valley Cooperative Homelessness Effort. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you, Mayor. And Chris Hallett, our Neighborhood and Human Services Director, will uh, put forward a, a recommended resolution for the West Valley to address homelessness in our region. And I'll pass it to Mr. Hallett. Thank you, Mr. Tyne, uh, Mayor and Council. Very excited to be here tonight. Uh, we've been meeting organically a bunch of West Valley cities uh, for the past 18 months since I've been here. Uh, and it's, we call ourselves the West Valley Human Services Coalition. In fact, we have a meeting again tomorrow. And it primarily makes up Avondale, El Mirage, Glendale, Goodyear, Peoria, Surprise, Tolleson, and Youngtown, to name a few. And what we've experienced in our interactions and working with the county and MAG is there's some power in the numbers. And what we'd look to do is to formalize what we've been actually doing uh, organically over this time. Now, it focuses primarily on human service uh, areas of concern, but we've primarily been focused a lot on the homeless lately and in conjunction with, and we adopted some of the language here that you see on this resolution from the county and MAG. Uh, it was adopted by the East Valleys, and we've seen tremendous success since they've adopted the resolution in 
competing for funds at the regional level from MAG and, and others. So we want to coalesce as the West Valley cities to do the same. Uh, efforts around the homelessness plague the whole region for sure. They certainly plague our West Valley cities uh, with our borders so uh, near and dear to each one of us. Uh, and the more we work together, the better we're going to be able to handle these uh, problems. Um, um, this will complement what we're already doing, as I said. Uh, it will, it will uh, and be in alignment with each of our city's uh, consolidated plans, which we just recently adopted, as well as with the county's consortium plan. Uh, we already have commitments from several of the cities. El Mirage already adopted this resolution two weeks ago. Uh, it's on the agenda for surprise in Peoria tonight. And Glendale's committed to take it in June or, or the next available one in August. There's others that have shown commitment. They're still working through their councils. We're certain that more will fall in place as soon as uh, several of the cities adopt the resolution, and we look forward to those. There's absolutely no cost to this. All it is is opens the doors for opportunity we see from grant funding and other uh, opportunities. Uh, we do meet, as I said, monthly, and it's not just uh, these agencies from these cities, we bring our law enforcement because there's a lot. We, we collaborate across the law enforcement of each of the jurisdictions, working with the county and the human uh, homeless management information system. We work with many of the nonprofit stakeholders to bring in and collaborate. Uh, it's this group that kind of yielded the two um, cooperative agreements that you have fully adopted with the, the, home, uh, uh, the emergency homeless bed night cooperative agreement, which is available to all the West Valley cities, as well as our uh, uh, homeless outreach and navigation is also a cooperative agreement. So as we do more of these, we can take advantage of each other's contracts. Uh, we hope to be able to, with this approval, continue doing what we've been doing uh, to research best practice, share data and contracts uh, in order to explore opportunities for a more balanced approach to homelessness. Mm -hmm. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Councilor, are there any questions? Uh, Homelessness is, is a really big subject, <laughs> and I can understand why you would want to collaborate with all of the cities. I mean, obviously, it doesn't stop at any of our borders, and it's more important for us to, to share the issue and find ways to um, solve it as a region. And so I completely appreciate that, um, and I appreciate the work that you and your team have done. Um, I know Benny Pena is in our audience here, and he has done a lot of work um, with our Peoria Police Department, and hopefully some of that can be shared. If, if it already hasn't been, I know he's pretty collaborative already. Um, but they, we have a lot of assets, and we're happy and able to share them. And so I appreciate you working on this, this issue as it continues to grow. And hopefully we can find ways to solve problems that um, seem quite large sometimes. So thanks very much for your efforts on this. And with that, um, I'll entertain a motion. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Um, we are going to circle back around to something that we um, slid to a different portion of our agenda at the very beginning, and this is a presentation on our Youth Council Liaison Service Awards. Um, and so I am going to just make a, a few remarks here, if I might, uh, to talk about our Youth Council Liaison Program. Every year, the City of Peoria uh, City Council provides youth with the opportunity to serve as non-voting members at City Council meetings. This is known as the Youth Council Liaison Program, and it is designed to provide Peoria youth a positive civic experience on the art of governance the art of governance, I love that term, and an opportunity to share different perspectives. This year, uh, Ritika Ravindran and Brighton Greathouse served as the two youth council liaisons and were sworn in on August 13th, 2019. Over the past nine months, Ms. Greathouse and Ms. Ravindran have actively participated in city council meetings, attended numerous community events, and have shared a youth perspective on issues of the day. Their leadership and insight have been invaluable, and they have made Peoria proud. We mean that. Uh, at your seat is a plaque thanking you for your service and dedication to our city. Is there anyone else from our city council who would care to make some remarks um, as we 
say farewell to our two youth council liaisons this season. Council Member Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. You you covered it beautifully, but I just I want to thank you both for participating and representing the youth, and you've done so so well with such professionalism, and though everything kind of came to a screeching halt, um, we won't forget your impact and your presence here, and keep up the great work and continuing to lead and set an example for other youth. Uh, it's so important. The work you're doing is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Dunn? I just wanted to thank you both also. You guys really showed a tremendous amount of leadership in, in some of the issues that you tackled and in, in working with the other youth. So it's, I just wanted to let you know that I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Councilmember Edwards? Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I would concur. Uh, you young ladies are phenomenal, and I know we're going to see great things coming out of you, you know, through you, and whatever you choose to do. I mean, just your your endeavor that you're working on mental health issues with youth in Peoria and with the West Valley. You guys took a leadership in that, and I just really commend you. Um, and getting into all the schools and working on not a very easy topic, but you guys handled it. Uh, with grace and hopefully the next uh, youth members will continue to uh, work on that on that goal So good luck in your future and if there's anything we can do, please don't hesitate to reach out to us Thank you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. If there's anything we can do in the future We are here for you and we thank you for being here for us for all this time. Congratulations All right, we are now going to move on to Call to the public for non-agenda items. I have not received any speaker request forms, so we will move on to reports from the city manager. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Council. This was a, a very substantial agenda that we had tonight, and uh, it took a lot of time and brain power to go through, but uh, was so important to us. Uh, you know, a couple of reasons, obviously, for that. Obviously, the Recent conditions had us focus on many other items, but also we have a little longer break between council meetings. So uh, very much appreciate this, but we're excited to see so much of our future uh, being discussed tonight. That's, that's kind of refreshing to be able to talk about that rather than just the here and now uh, as we go through. Wanted to give a, a little bit of a here and now conversation about um, our COVID-19 update and just provide you a little bit of detail. So as we continue to adjust to the new normal that we call 2020, it's important to remember that as a city, we still remain in phase one of our recovery efforts. And as we watch key statistics that are showing that COVID activity mm -hmm. is continuing in Maricopa County, we want to remain flexible and vigilant as we run our daily affairs. So while a number of Peoria facilities are indeed open and a host of our programs are running, we will need to watch those act and the activity within there very closely. Uh, I would like to congratulate our staff continually to adapt to these changing conditions. It's been an amazing uh, t time for all of us, but I've just been so impressed and proud of our staff as they've worked through this. One great example of that is the planned July 4th event that we have coming up. While we were unable to put on a large special event at the sports complex grounds, we will be offering a fireworks display in different locations, three different locations throughout the city, which we will hope will allow for residents to be uh, view these fireworks from their homes and common areas in all of the different areas. So very neat and exciting uh, adjustment to things. Also want to uh, continue to talk about the new economic realities that we also focus as well. Fortunately, as I had discussed in our study session two weeks ago, we have been bolstered by federal financial assistance. And thank you to Governor Ducey and his allocation of the AZ CARES funding, along with revenue from the Community Development Block Grant, Federal Transit As uh, Association, other federal grants that have gone through it is going a long way to maintaining the services that are so important to our residents while not placing an additional tax or fee burden on our residents and businesses. Per your direction two weeks ago, and also approved on consent agenda tonight, uh, we did put forward a number of different investments that we will deploy CARES Act funding quickly to get back into our community. So very briefly, we have our three deputy city managers to highlight some of the key elements of our support. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it first, I believe, to Mr. Granger, and then we'll just go left. 
left to right for them. Sure, thank you, Mr. Tyne, uh, Mayor and Council. From a, uh, as uh, Mr. Tyne mentioned, uh, thank, thanks to the CARES Act grant as well as the Department of Justice, which uh, uh, we were approved for a grant for $82,800 that you approved tonight. That will help us um, provide ser additional services to our citizens from both a police and a fire medical perspective. Um, from a fire medical perspective, uh, with the CARES Act funding, we, uh, we propose for $500,000 will allow for the operation of a two-person community paramedicine unit that will operate seven days a week, um, eight hours a day. It's a two-person crew uh, that will last approximately one year with that funding. So that will help us address the pandemic as well as other community uh, paramedic issues that we've got throughout the city. And then for the police department with an additional $500,000 as well as that Department of Justice grant, um, the funding will allow for additional PPE equipment and cleaning supplies for the police department, equipment for uh, the police department to work remotely instead of in their offices during the pandemic, uh, a traffic message board that will increase public awareness, especially with the pandemic and, and uh, provide mess public messages while uh, traveling throughout the city department vehicles for, this, for the police department, and then additional overtime and one-time staffing for COVID-19 quarantine requirements and enforcement patrols. With that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Gregory. Thanks, Andy. Uh, as uh, mayor and council, as you are aware, we've been working very closely with our small businesses, trying to assess um, and understand what their needs are um, and how we can address some of those with the additional Funding that came through with the CARES Act, we have some opportunities that uh, weren't available to us possibly even before. Uh, but we are looking at a couple of different programs that would help assist our small businesses. And again, focusing uh, some CDBG dollars towards uh, some businesses that fall into the low mod income where they either employ low mod income individuals or they themselves as a business um, are considered low moderate uh, income. Um, we'd look, like to look at uh, finding ways to get them some funding through CDBG to help um, assist their businesses deal with some of the recovery pieces that, they're, that are still uh, lingering. We're also looking at developing, um, which we've already developed and, and are getting ready to uh, put out the uh, small business loan program. This again, I think I've mentioned before, is a partnership with one of the local banks, Bell Bank. Um, and what this really does is that the city, uh, the city would, would be, the, the role the city has in this is that we would be a guarantor of the funding um, for some of these loans, meaning their personal loans, but that um, we would be looking to uh, underwrite to some degree those loans in, the, in this sense or be the guarantor of these loans so that the bank can offer low interest rates, favorable terms, and get to those some of those, those small businesses that have been still continuing to struggle to find funding. Um, so it's another avenue um, of resources. Um, we're also going to be looking to, with some CARES Act funding, and this will be uh, kind of coming out a little bit later, um, is uh, to put some of that funding towards up to a million dollars of that towards some small business grants. Now the key to this is that we'd have to work with a third party, um, not for profit, uh, that could help administer this program. That's our that's our desire is to find a third party not for profit who could administer this program on behalf of the city, um, and get those direct grants out to our uh, small businesses in the city. So that's another program we're working on. Um, la not lastly, but another item is the uh, that ca actually came out of the mayor's ad hoc uh, committee is uh, looking to see if there's ways that we can provide businesses, especially restaurants, but retail businesses as well with a, um, what I'd call a reopening and um, uh, inspection to some degree of someone who a third party could come in and say, they have met all of the CDC requirements. They are following those requirements in, in their operations with their, with their uh, businesses, and therefore they are, have been identified um, in some way, shape, or form as a uh, business that is doing that. And we'd like to be able to provide those services so that we can get those inspections out there. One of the things we're finding is a lot of businesses are feeling that customers are maybe hesitant to come back, concerned that maybe not all the guidelines are being followed. This would be a way for us to help them um, meet those, show that they're meeting those guidelines and that they are they are ready and, and open for business. And then the last one would be uh, with our small businesses is really going to be this uh, uh, local business promotion. Um, we're going to use some CARES Act funding to make to get out and survey um, our local businesses, assess what are those continued needs, 
what we saw in the beginning of the of the pandemic is different than what we're seeing now in terms of the needs of some of these businesses. They're beginning to um, get back to business, but it's not as robust, clearly. So what are some of those needs and what are the other services that we might be able to do to boost their marketing and promotional efforts and get really get their name out there? Not all businesses um, are as uh, as uh, uh, robust in the way that they market and, and promote their business. So we want to make sure that they have the tools um, to do that. So we would be working with with um, some different partners to help do that for the small businesses or at least give them some assistance in that. I'll Thank give it to you. Sure. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, Katie talked a lot about small business support, which is vital. Um, I get the other piece of that, which is people make up and are employed by a lot of small businesses. So because of COVID and the, and the impacts, it's, it's, we know it's going to have, and it already has, uh, you know, unemployment rates are up. There may be social um, concerns that pop up. We're fortunate enough to, to hopefully use a bit of this money for additional utility assistance. Uh, we're, we're requesting and we'd like to use about half a million dollars for that. We know there will be individuals that won't be able to pay the power, the gas, the water, and so on. So if we if we ramp that up, we feel very comfortable that it will be well met by our community. Rental and mortgage assistance, um, that's going to be a big item. And um, we know that individuals uh, will have difficulty probably paying their rent um, or their mortgage. So we will be working with a third-party nonprofit to administer up to a million dollars worth of mortgage and rent assistance, and it will be um, structured in a way that they qualify based on their income and where they perhaps live. And we expect that we can assist about uh, 300 or so pure residents. It's not a whole lot when you look at a monthly rent and a monthly mortgage, but it's something to start from. A couple other quick things from a social standpoint, some are child care services and child care in general. Um, we have introduced uh, professional nursing staffs. We're doing wellness checks on the participants. We've had to downsize the number of individuals that participate in those. It has an added cost, so we are seeking some of the funds to use for that. We're looking at about $75,000 over the next six months. And then finally, this is, this is kind of unique. One of the things we thought we could do is, hey, in our libraries of all places, what can we do to potentially help students that may not have access to technology uh, and are receiving assignments from their schools and uh, they can't afford uh, Wi-Fi connections or may not even have um, Chromebooks, personal laptop devices. So a portion of the funds we are seeking, about $150,000. It will cover purchase price and a little bit of the operating expense initially. Um, we want to buy an additional 200 of those to offer up to Peoria students and really residents also who may be seeking employment jobs um, because of the, the, uh, the circumstances they're faced with. We really think that uh, that will be well received by the community and, and we feel very strongly it's the right thing to do at this point in time. A couple other things that we'll be doing, um, maintaining a, self, uh, a healthy uh, work environment, campus, and, and city facilities is very important to us, not only for employees, but also for customers that come here. So a good portion, about $380,000 of, of we hope to use will be for additional cleaning um, and response devices. You've heard a little bit about fogging machines that you can spray um, in vehicles. We're looking at acquiring those. There's new technology, UV lights, um, portable UV lights, that if there is an instance or instance of uh, uh, COVID breaking out somewhere, we can de deploy those and use those in our city facilities. So in a nutshell, we're kind of looking at really, really strengthening um, our, our offerings to the Peoria community from a social and human service standpoint and additional PPP and E and, and, um, and uh, healthy work environments. Wow. <laughs> and that is a tremendous amount of of giving back and additional assets for our business community and for our residents. Uh, it's very impressive and I really thank you guys for all of the work that you have put forward to so carefully define how we can use this money for the greatest good and the longest term uh, effect. So thank you very, very much. We appreciate it. Kathy. 
Yes, Council Member Hunt. Eric, I just had a quick question back to the students and getting the Chromebooks or whatever we decide to provide. What about those that don't really have access to to the Wi-Fi, to the, I yep. know that's a problem here in South Peoria especially, I don't know about the North. Yep, Mayor, um, Council Member Hunt, um, the answer is is there's, we're proposing to also purchase devices that are portable that you'll mm -hmm. be able to check out from your library. Our library, you can take those home if you don't have um, Wi-Fi service, if you don't have access to it um, for whatever reason, you'll be able to check that out, um, attach that to your computer, and you'll have that, that access to the internet and to do your assignments from a... Yeah, that's a, that's a great little contrivance. I have one of those yeah. myself. And They're wonderful, yes. Yeah, that, that's a very good use of that money because it doesn't do any good to have the computer if you can't get the signal, so. Yes. Good job, all of you. Great. That it, it sounds wonderful to be given a whole lot of money, doesn't it? But then when it's really quite a job to spend it properly. <laughs> so good job. Thank you. Thanks very much. You know, one just last comment to that is, um, you know, we, we use that term community partnership quite often. But when we think about what's happened since mid-March, where we had a council that gave us direction about we need to infuse investments early and often in the areas of for those that are most vulnerable into our business community who are most hit. And then you had stakeholders, including citizens and ad hoc committees and the business community and the higher institutions and the chamber give us their subject matter expertise. And then you have the staff to put this forward in a short amount of time. It's something that we should all be proud of in Peoria. So mm -hmm. with that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I would like to make a few comments. Uh, you just heard from our city manager, Jeff Tyne, and we don't often talk about our city manager. He's kind of behind the scenes there, but he is really um, running our city. He is the CEO of our city. And last week, our city council took some time to assess the city manager's performance over the last year. And I just want to publicly commend Jeff Tyne for a job well done. Um, a lot of a lot of unusual things have occurred this year. I think everybody knows 2020 has been a, a, a different kind of year. Um, then he was on track, moving council goals forward, such as the agreement that we heard about tonight. Uh, the developer of Stadium Point was here, and that plan um, is tremendous for the future of our city. And um, Plans are progressing around Old Town and the revitalization of our uh, historic district down there as well as um, the Valley Wise Hospital area. So that is all moving forward. Uh, we also discussed this evening some very large milestone infrastructure projects that have to do with water. And these are all future changing projects. Uh, occurring at the same time, uh, the same time that he was already leading a financially stable um, organization of excellence. Then a global pandemic hit. And Jeff calmly and deliberately uh, moved into emergency management mode, uh, protecting service delivery for our residents while monitoring and uh, modifying employee working conditions for safety and for reliability for our citizens. And the situation continued to change very, very rapidly. The environment from day to day was something new. And he systematically shut down the city and um, while guiding public safety and making sure that we, can, we maintained financial security uh, for the city of Peoria, he offered multiple avenues, and some of which you've heard this evening, of assistance to our small business community uh, who suffered immediate and severe impacts from having to close down for, of course, health and safety reasons. Then, as it continued to evolve based on CDC guidelines, uh, he created a plan for phased reopening for our city. I even had a reporter call me and say, uh, nobody else has put forth a phased reopening plan yet. Please tell me about that. You're the first one in the Valley. So um, that was tremendous. And as of today, we, we continue to abide with caution in phase one. And he did all of this without 
havoc or fear of any kind, as a good leader does. Uh, Jeff, as, as you can see, sitting here at the study session table tonight, Jeff has built a strong coalition of leaders around him. And they work as an incredible team throughout the year. Uh, but their synergy was especially evident during this unprecedented time. So thanks to all of you for all of the extra, extra work that you always put in. And even though it was warranted during these difficult times, Jeff has chosen to forego any adjustments to his contract. And on behalf of the Peoria City Council, I just want to say thank you for the outstanding job that you were doing before the global pandemic hit and for your strong and smart management as we continue to navigate through it. So you have our gratitude. Thank you. I just wanted to bring that up. We don't often get to talk about our city manager. Tonight, we did. So with that, we are adjourned.